For the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. <clears throat> you can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings in, and, public, and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The, f the full re re hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony was on April 26 at 6 p.m. And the following will be on June 2nd at 6 p.m. virtually. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. <laughs> For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm.boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or residence and Limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. You can email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov or submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0480-20482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be Boston Planning and Development Agency, BPDA. Our panelists for today's hearing are Arthur Jeminson, Director of Boston Planning and Development Agency, Derek Devin Cork, Director of Real Estate, Michelle Goldberg, Director of Finance and Chief Procurement Officer, Trin, sorry Trin, how do you say your last name? Wynn. Win, thank you. Uh, Director of Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm joined today by my colleagues, um, Councillor President Ed Flynn, District 2, Councillor Mike Flaherty at large, Councillor Frank Baker, District 3, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor Kenzie Bach, District 8, Councillor Ruthie Lujan at large. I will allow you um, 20 minutes for your presentation, um, and then we'll go to first round of questioning. Each counselor will have eight minutes for their line of questions, and it's up to them to moderate their time. Uh, then we'll go into public testimony. Um, hopefully, we, we try to prioritize at least the first 10. Um, that will take up about 20 minutes. We'll go to second round of questioning, and then third, and then uh, we'll end up, if there are more people signed up to testify virtually, we'll go to the final um, people on the list. Without further ado, you now have the floor for your presentation. Good afternoon and thanks so much for uh, inviting us. Um, my name is Arthur Jamison. I'm the director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. I'm also the chief of planning. Um, thrilled to be here with you to uh, provide testimony uh, consistent with the process. Um, I'm uh, starting my second week in the job, uh, so I'm just getting to know the uh, leaders uh, that are here next to me um, for uh, and getting a sense of uh, the way that 
uh, BPDA uh, works in the, uh, in, the, in the current manifestation of the uh, agency as a former uh, staffer of this agency back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, I'm, I'm going to be here to, uh, to provide and answer any questions you might have about uh, direction and perspective, but uh, because this is a budget hearing with, with a specific prescribed uh, scope, I'm going to allow um, uh, Michelle, our Director of Finance, um, and Chief Procurement Officer uh, to lead off uh, with an introduction uh, and the background appropriate. I do want, I did think you introduced all the uh, colleagues I have up here, so I won't do it again. Um, but I did want to ask Michelle if she could uh, take it from here. There you go. Thank you, Chief. Um, my name is Michelle Goldberg. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Fernandez Anderson and members of the council. I am the Director of Finance and Chief Procurement Officer for the Boston Planning and Development Agency. As an independent, self-sustaining organization, the BPDA is made up of five business units that interact through what is referred to as related party transactions. The units are composed of three major entities, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, or BRA, the Economic Development Industrial Corporation, or EDIC, which includes the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, or OWD, and the Boston Industrial Development Finance Authority, or BIDFA. There are two minor entities which are associated with 501c3 nonprofits, the Boston Local Development Corporation, or BLDC, and Friends of Youth Opportunity Boston, or FYOB. Together, these organizations make up the Boston Planning and Development Agency. I'm looking forward to a rich conversation with you about the BPDA's budget and financial activities. Although our FY23 budget won't be final and approved until our direct board of directors meet on, July, on June 16, we can discuss FY22, and we provided our third quarter update in the questionnaire responses. And with that, I can hop into BPDA's sources and uses. BPDA operating revenue is derived from several categories. First, rental leases and parking. This revenue represents all ground lease, tenant leases, and parking fees associated with BPDA-owned properties. Much of that revenue is spent on maintenance and overhead related to owning that property. Should there be a land transaction that is certain to take place in a given fiscal year, we will budget for that one-time revenue in the sale of real estate category. The slide here shows our equity participation revenue, which has internal restrictions that support specific BRA activities. Grants and donations include both OWD funds and a reflection of the subsidies that EDIC sends to the BRA. Our smallest category is any late fees or interest we need to reflect for our holdings. Moving into our expense budget categories for FY22, Personnel and benefits represents the largest category of our expenses for the BPDA. It is important to note that the costs related to operating OWD's community-based organizations are accounted for in contractual services. Adding personnel and CBO expenses together would account for about 60% of BPDA expenses. So the green, dark, blue, and teal sections of that pie chart up there. The next category is general administrative expenses and the contractual services group. Contractual services includes externally funded uh, uh, pass-through grants for the community-based organizations as well as planning studies and the intercompany grant from BRA to EDIC. Property management, on this next slide here, is where we are starting to see more expenses. Our assets are rapidly deteriorating and in this category, we attempt to fund large repairs that do not qualify to be capitalized. Happy to get into that more later if folks like. We anticipate this trend to continue as more of our construction projects will focus on maintaining our assets. Most folks know us for the development activity that runs through our agency. The BPDA finance staff are also responsible for the fiduciary management of funds that do not go towards BPDA expenses. Funding such as community benefits, notes receivable, mass works grants, and linkage, those funds do not support BPDA operations. If we look at our department budget slide, it breaks down all of those expenses by cost center. 
And so you can see, again, our real estate department is maintaining our assets and OWD is providing community-based organization funding. As mentioned before, much of our focus is on our construction needs. We have invested a great deal of effort building databases to gather more detail about those infrastructure needs since our initial inventory project in 2017. We now anticipate a total of $450 million in necessary repairs and improvements over the next 10 years. The BPDA has concurrently been trying to align all of this critical work with supplier diversity efforts. In the discussion, I would be happy to share how our equitable procurement plan seeks to alleviate the various barriers in procurement that stand in our buying plan. This investment is a significant sum and will require the BPDA to continue thoughtful financial planning in the years ahead to ensure that these, needed, these needs are appropriately addressed in the most equitable way possible. With that, I will turn it back to the council so that we may begin questions. We do have some supporting slides if we need to flip to them, and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Councillor uh, Mike Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you, Arthur. It's been a while. Uh, congratulations on your new assignment and look forward to, to working with you and your team. And obviously we see Devin um, and um, Michelle and Trin uh, a lot more, uh, but we'll be seeing you more moving forward. So um, it's a pleasure having uh, worked with you in the past. I guess uh, I want to opine just briefly um, on the challenge that we have, I think, as a city as we're sort of coming out of COVID and we're seeing some of the economic realities uh, across uh, the country and the world. The challenge for Boston is how do we keep that investment? How do we keep that development? How do we keep those housing opportunities coming? Uh, CEOs uh, are constantly talking about moving their companies here to tap into a lot of our great strengths. Uh, you know, we get the best colleges, universities in the world. We get the best hospitals, a network of community health centers. We've got financial services. Uh, we've got a direct pipeline. We're a sort of livable, walkable, and relatively safe city uh, for cities our size or bigger. So we have a lot of mojo going on that people really want to participate in. And I think one of the challenges we have is, particularly on the life science side of the house, is to balance um, the life science lab side. So I know that the demand currently exceeds uh, the sort of the available inventory, whether you, some people say it's the demand is 13 to 15 million square feet, but we can sort of accommodate six to eight. We're starting to see sort of the life science and the labs kind of maybe, for lack of a better word, creep closer to the, to the neighborhoods. Um, and just having a sort of a clearly defined set of rules. Uh, because it's all, for, for me, as, as an at-large member of the council, it's all about predictability. It's predictability for the community, for the residents that we represent, but it's also predictability for uh, the investors and for the, uh, the team and, the, uh, and the, 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 the general contractors, the shovels that are going in the ground. Uh, they need a level of predictability as well. So um, I guess the question, I guess, is you know, how, how, what's the focus in terms of how we balancing that portion of it and recognizing that as we start to see labs kind of coming closer to the neighborhood, uh, having sort of some type of zoning or, um, or a process. Um, that's one. Two is the Ray Flynn Marine Industrial Park and the EDIC. You know that well, Devin. I'm very fond of that place down there. When I joined the council, I want to say that was about 5,000 people going to work down there. That probably is at least doubled, may have tripled. Uh, lots of great things going on that we, uh, the council, but also the local elected officials and the community allowed for the BRA to, to lift up um, the marine industrial uses that went from seafood processing, cold storage, uh, freight forwarding, uh, marine ship repair to allow some other uses. So making sure that um, the long-term stakeholders don't feel that they are getting snookered and they're, uh, they're being overrun, but offering an opportunity for more companies to grow down there, but to make sure that we're, we have a clearly defined percentage there. Uh, Devin, you know those numbers better than I do, is folks are looking to come down to the Ray Flynn Marine Industrial Park. We just want to make sure that if, if they're not marine industrial, freight forwarding, cold storage, seafood processing, marine ship repair, that, that, they're, um, that they're in that percentage of, uh, of being uh, an allowed use down there. And then just a final shout out to some of the dedicated employees you have, uh, Heather Campazzato, Rich McGinnis, Mike Christopher, uh, Teresa Paul Hemus, uh, all no matter what day of the week, no matter what hour of the day, uh, if there's a question or a concern or an issue or a development 
um, or an opportunity to, to convene folks uh, there, uh, willing and ready, and right at the um, right at the helm with the two hands on the wheel, making sure that uh, they are putting their best foot forward on behalf of the agency, but they're also um, true public servants uh, looking to try to make a difference. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't give uh, some of those folks a shout out. So if you could just take those two uh, those two questions on the balance uh, on the life science lab side of the house and also uh, the marine industrial park percentages would be great. Sure, well, um, through the chair to, uh, uh, to uh, council member um, Flaherty. So yes, I would tell you that in my last uh, week, I've been briefed on a lot of matters and one of the most interesting was um, a briefing on life sciences and um, and lab space and, and the demand for it, um, just how much of demand there is, uh, the places that it's beginning to show up, um, and, and the ways and the kind of demands it has, um, and the ways that it inter interacts with our plans. Um, so I'm coming up to speed on it. I would tell you that, um, you know, I'd ask all the kinds of questions I would ask about any emergent business uh, that has a need for real estate. So, you know, what is the nature of its demand? Uh, is you know who are the, uh, the the players who are demanding the space? Um, what are the features of you know it, it, when it's needed, um, the, the ways that it's used, the duration, what the workforce looks like, um, you know what kind of uh, housing needs and and also trip generation and um, and parking and other needs that that the use has, um, and then you know how do um, many of the things I know about life sciences have to do with um, you know. PhDs have to explain them, you mm -hmm. know. So, um, you know, how do we make sure that Bostonians are participating in uh, in the jobs that are created in the business, not just the construction jobs, um, uh, but also the jobs in, in the building, and, and what are their career ladders inside, uh, once they're inside the building. So I'm coming up to speed on all those things, and I think as you, uh, what I'm hoping to do with, um, with the guidance of the uh, planning team is uh, identify some uh, some criteria and some goals um, for the industry and how we maximize its economic benefit for our region and then define how what victory looks like for us and how we it sets us up these are the other places in the country that people might want to have uh, life sciences how we can be as competitive as possible and create the um, the inventory of uh, of space uh, required um, to so to satisfy the, the proven demand um, so that's a little bit on life sciences. Uh, I would I agree with you. We need to create a balance um, because, like, like any other use, it has uh, it has dimensions that need to be that have impacts, and the impacts need to be measured and mitigated. So um, I can answer maybe even the, if there's more specific questions during your eight minutes, I can answer them. But I might ask Devin to try take a stab at your second one, so you have enough as yeah, much time as possible. Thank you, uh, Chief. And obviously, Devin, you know the model from Marine Industrial Park, where we're we're trying to protect the warehouses and stuff, and we can see the opportunity potentially wide at Circle, uh, New Market, uh, maybe even over the Mass and Cassie mm -hmm. area, and even uh, the Pappas site, where we've got these light manufacturing, blue collar jobs, good companies arguably being priced out because we're a land poor city and everyone's chasing the buck on the real estate. If there's an opportunity for us to be creative where well, we keep those industrial, keep those light manufacturing on that first floor, but allow the upper floors to maybe fetch yep. some of those rents. So I think striking that balance, particularly uh, we've seen it and it's sort of paying dividends down Marine Industrial Park, but also Wide Ed Circle, New Market, um, Pappas, and you know, one sure way if we can uh, give a, uh, an economic development shot in the arm to mass and cast the residents over there, the businesses over mm -hmm. there, they've absolutely had it. And if you haven't seen it over the last few weeks, the, the, it, it, it's, it's yep. growing again. Yep. So um, short of them getting a massive tax break, which this council has is, is, is got a matter in committee right now to talk about an abatement for the poor landowners and building owners and business owners and residents over there, um, something needs to happen. And if we could take that sort of that model that we've got in Marine Industrial Park and bring it to those other areas, so we're keeping the light manufacturing, we're mm -hmm. keeping those warehouses, uh, the freight forwardings, the fruit and produce, the meat markets, but we're allowing some flexibility in the upper floors and giving them some heightened density uh, so that they're able to sort of take advantage of the economic opportunity without selling and then chasing that business out to, you know, Brockton or Easton or Middleborough or Plainville or wherever, you know, New Rhode Island. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor. Well, um, 
first let me start by thanking you and, and Councillor Flynn and the rest of, the, of this body for your support of the Flynn Marine Park. It's, it, it's a unique and special place. It's one of the two uh, largest land, that along with Charlestown Navy Yard are the two largest land buildings in the BPDA's inventory. And as you well know, and I think your, your comments spoke to this already, it was founded for the, with the mission of keeping a maritime economy in Boston, knowing that that land is very valuable and there are other uses that could be, could be cited there. We've um, done a lot of work through our updated master plan to make sure that that, that maritime economy is protected in the future. So to answer your question on the number, it's 67%. So 67% of the um, ground floor equivalent land area needs to remain maritime industrial. Um, the remainder of the marine park is uh, uh, allowed for general industrial and some, uh, just, you know, I think 5% is the cap on commercial and that's meant to be supporting commercial uses uh, for the maritime and general industrial businesses. Um, within general industrial is life science. So there is a significant life science cluster building within the marine park. Um, I would argue that that is very much the support of that mission because the, the maritime tenants you know, in some cases can't make it economically on their own and certainly not with some of the capital infrastructure repair needs that Michelle spoke to that support the maritime economy. So that's where that, that funding is being generated in order to make investments in the maritime economy. And, and, and it's going well. And, and uh, I think the one other thing I'd add to it is that's also a place where we draw a lot of our funding to support the rest of our mission as well. So as that, as that area changes, we need to keep that maritime, those blue collar jobs there, we need to protect those, we need to help subsidize them. But at the same time, we're, we're actually able to take some of the capital out of the Marine Park and help support our mission in the, uh, broadly across the city. Thank you. I, thank you, General Weiner. Councilor President Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the BPDA team that's here, and thank you, um, thank you, Director, for, for your testimony as well. I just wanted to follow up on a couple couple of issues. As it relates to life sciences, I, I probably have maybe 20 proposals, uh, potential proposals going into District, district 2 um, in, the, in the coming more towards the neighborhood as well, as, as you know. My big concern, or one of my big concerns is how are we going to ensure that residents, especially at the youngest ages, um, have an opportunity to learn about life sciences at the earliest age, the STEM subjects, math and science, you know, educating our young students at age, at grade one or grade two about the importance of these subjects, and then hopefully someday they're prepared to get to go into the life sciences if, if, mm -hmm. if they choose, but at least they'll have a good academic background. Um, so, so that's what I ask a lot of these development teams when they want to come in about life sciences. This, I think they're still struggling with that, with that question, and we need to provide them some guidance on exactly um, what we expect from life sciences as it relates to what benefit it could have on residents, young students, BPS students. They might be living in Roxbury, they might be living in, in Charlestown, they might be living in Mattapan or Southie or Chinatown. So just want to see what your thoughts might be on that. Well, through the chair to President Flynn. So uh, President Flynn, I've, um, one of the things that um, has come to my attention, both um, in a very brief discussion with, uh, with Councilmember Baker uh, and others, um, has been an effort by the industry. I think this is one of the reasons why the prior question was very appropriate. What's the sort of industry strategy question? Uh, because um, everyone wants to know if this is such a, a strong growing business, how do I get my son uh, or daughter or members of my family into the business and how do I get access to it? Um, so I've begun to hear uh, from different quarters in particular, it seems that there's a group forming around uh, of, of um, both developers and people, uh, and industry leaders, to say we need to have academies, we need to have special uh, places and organizations where young people can, at at a uh, at a young age, learn. But also we can get people who are older, uh, and maybe opportunity youth is a word they sometimes use about people who may uh, be of college age but not uh, in not not in education 
at this time, how do we get those folks tracked into the work associated with life sciences? So um, I'm interested to see where that goes, but to your point, it, I, I guess I hear you saying that needs to be kind of an expectation that's set out front. Um, and I'm, I'm absorbing that, and I think as we uh, I continue to get briefed by the team, you may hear more uh, about uh, how I've absorbed the, that information, but saying it's something we expect uh, would, is a, is a, is an interesting idea. Um, but that was a question to me. I want to make sure, if you, I know you have the time limit, I want to make sure you get a chance to ask more. Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Um, I appreciate your answer. One of the things I've focused on since I arrived here, along with Council of Flaherty, down at the South Boston Waterfront, Flynn Marine Industrial Park, and I've worked with your, your team on it, um, Devin and M Michael Christopher and, and others. Um, lack of basic city services um, down, down in the South Boston Waterfront. We have made progress, I have to say, in terms of the EMS presence going in there. But, but like you, I get calls from business owners that want to relocate to the South Boston Waterfront and, and they were asking, do we have basic city services there? And, and I said, you know, we don't, but we are getting them. Um, you know, we are getting an EMS presence very soon. So, you know, having an EMS presence, potentially having a fire presence, we have Boston police, we have state police down there, Massport police. Um, that's also part of a neighborhood and when we're encouraging businesses to come here, life sciences including and residents, we need to make sure that we're providing basic city services such as EMS presence because I know the, the response time, especially during traffic getting in and out of the South Boston waterfront is going up. So just want to hear what your thoughts might be on basic city services in and around the, the South Boston waterfront. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. Um, I mean, you've been a great advocate on this topic. I, mean, I know we've had numerous conversations, and, and one of the you know, results is obviously the EMS station we're excited to be hosting on our property, working with public facilities and Deanna Irish's team to get that built into the near future. Um, on, on the fire services uh, front, we've had a number of conversations with the, the commissioner, with public facilities, and we are working now on putting out an RFP for the old Davis Seafood site on, um, at 7 Channel Street, um, which is a dilapidated warehouse, can't, can't, can't be reused as is. Um, I know there's some life science interest in that property based on adjacent uses, and it's outside the DPA, so the designated port area. So it could host other uses, but most importantly to your question, what we're requiring in that RFP is for the, um, any developers responding to it to include the corn shelf for an engine company a fire station on the first floor uh, as a way of doing exactly what you just said, having the, um, the, the private sector growth in the area help pay for those basic city services that the, that the area needs. Thank you, and just want to finally say um, it's been a pleasure working with Tran as well on workforce development, job training issues. I know that's an important subject that your team works on, making sure that we're able to connect residents with job training programs so that they're able to um, have the skills for a career. So I just want to say thank you to you and your team for um, being proactive and being um, a, good, a good neighbor to so many Boston residents providing job training opportunities for them. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Friend. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, probably for Devin. Devin, uh, how, do we, how do we measure what's happening in the development scene in the city? Is it, is it um, planning, completed projects? And like, so can you lay out <clears throat> what it looks like from pre-COVID 18, 19 to what it is now and what we expect in the future? If, if you're, 
Yeah. Yes. That might be a lot too, but if you can. That, that is an excellent question, Councillor, and, and I think it goes to something I think that's really important to this team is measuring success and progress and sort of setting what are our goals and how are we tracking progress against them. I don't have in front of me right now a oh, well, set of numbers. Can, but but that's something I'm going to be looking at. So if you can put together a, a package, that would be nice to me. What, sure. what were the permanent projects in 18 or 19 you picked so we can see what the trajectory of the city yes, of the city is going to be um that that would be helpful to me um have you are you familiar and i'm just going to throw them out whoever wants to answer it's probably mostly for devin but devin um i was involved a little bit in the um it was a direct designation of housing dollars with the region on on the on the, the waterfront and we they built the senior home on, I can't think of the name, but it was a BHA held lot, direct designation. Are you familiar with it? I'm not familiar with the project off the top of my head, okay. Councilor, I'm sorry. Uh, are you familiar with direct designation? Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Have we ever used it in a, in a um, job training sense? Direct designation of housing dollars or of land? Direct designation of, I, uh, of, of monies that come in for IDP money. Right, so that, that the project that is- Yeah, so Regent had something like $5 million, $5 million in, in monies that were gonna be IDP money. Mm -hmm. They, they um, were in discussions with BHA and South Boston um, CDC at, the, at that time, and right on, it's O'Connor Way, there was a BHA held parking lot. Right. So that money was seed money to be able to start that project. Do you have any opinions on direct designation? So I think- how, how, what, what is, like how do we direct designate? Yeah, I defer to uh, Chief Jemison and also Chief Dillon on this topic because this is very much at the center of their partnership but doesn't together. It with, doesn't it sit with you? That money sits with you No, guys. the IDP do dollars now sit with uh, Department of Mayor's oh, Office of Housing. And the IDP being and anything o anything over 100,000 square feet commercial, that's IDP money? That's linkage. Linkage dollars also sit with the uh, Mayor's Office of Housing and Neighborhood Housing Trust. And is that anything over the 100,000? Why don't we do this? What's IDP? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's linkage? What's mitigation? So true. Great questions. Um, so on that, so uh, in inclusionary housing policy is associated with housing creation. So any any housing over nine units in the city, 13% of the- um, That's the yeah, IDP. That's the IDP. So, and, and that is something that's under review right now by yeah. Sheila and her And the so linkage is over 100,000 square feet. Exactly, anything commercial. Okay. Those are dollars. I'm looking at linkage dollars, direct designation. Yeah, and so I think the question is whether a project should be allowed to put its m money into its own it's into its own project. Not necessarily. And there could be there could be a good job training facility happening. There could be there could be um, housing where people are uh, connecting on with with um, with nonprofits that may own the land. Things like that. Yeah. Is, is there an appetite in this with you guys yeah. for direct designation? And, and how would someone go about doing that? I think the answer to that question is at this moment of transition. And again. I, defer to Chief Johnson here. I think we're open to any conversation about anything that will help us use our dollars better to create more affordability in our city. I think what's important is that as we set up new systems and structures, it's very clear where that decision making lies. I think, and I, I could be wrong about this, I think the question you're asking that decision making actually lies with the Neighborhood Housing Trust and making it clear that that's not a, that's not a BPDA decision, we actually defer to the Neighborhood Housing Trust. But it funnels, it funnels for you in the Neighborhood, neighborhood Housing Trust, it's, I, I'm talking about before it gets to the Neighborhood Housing Trust. How do we, how do we have the conversation if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a district city councilor yep. that's getting ready to have a million square feet, six million square feet developed over the next, yep. the next five, uh, five to 10 to 15 years is gonna be $50 million and whatever the number yeah. is gonna be, how do we, how do we, myself as the current District 3 counselor, and I'll yeah. speak about District 3, and whoever's sitting where you guys are sitting, how do we deal with that developer and say, you know, here's a housing opportunity, here's a job training. What does that look like? Is it always gonna, like, is there an administrative or an executive decision that always has to be made there, and, and how do we get, a, get around that, maybe? I mean, uh, through the chair to, um, Member Baker, I would, I, I think the, the question is, uh, there's two answers. One, um, over the next, I think, 60 to 90 days, 
Um, we're expecting there to be uh, the completion of studies about uh, what the appropriate IDP uh, ratios should be um, and a recommendation. Um, similarly, uh, we're expecting something similar with, uh, with linkage. So Devin's comment that we want to have any conversation um, uh, is, is completely accurate. The, the other point about the Neighborhood Housing Trust, I think you, you're asking the question of us that I think is it's a fair question probably of, of them and to me and Sheila, which is if I'm going to have this amount of development, you know, I, you, what should I expect would happen in my neighborhood uh, in terms of investments in, in affordable housing and job training? I think the, the, the difficult thing about direct designation, as I remember it from the old days, is that, um, you know, if you start to say, like, well, my part of the city is having this impact um, and we should have the resource allocation, um, that becomes a, that can be a tense conversation. And so we have the Neighborhood Housing Trust to help us say, what are the citywide issues, um, but while also respecting and understanding your reasonable request, I'm experiencing development, how do I protect my neighborhood? Um, so I think the next 60 to 90 days creates an opportunity for us to talk and for the things we talk about to, to be part of uh, what is, is studied and then what's recommended. Okay, well, that, I would like to go offline at some point with yep. with whoever you whoever you designate We're to figure to out how we do that because my neighborhood traditionally has never had any development. We're living through the development now, right. so I would argue. And again, I'm not looking to keep all the do dollars right in my community. I'm looking I'm looking to build units because I've sat on the housing trust, I sit on the the jobs mm -hmm. trust, and I see. Not that we don't do go great work in both places. I see us take money and cut it up, cut it up to, 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 to pieces very small. little pieces where five million going into a, going into a housing development is real money. Five hundred thousand is maybe the plans for something. Right. So, if we're able to connect on to city lands, direct designation, you know, and do things on the front end as the city, whether if we're providing land or providing um, like what the NHI did, they, they gave actual, this is what we want built on this city land and the permits were mm -hmm. turned right over. If we're doing things like that as a city and then using direct designation monies, I think we can get some units built. The, I'm sorry, I know you said it right on. Can he finish that? I yes. One question to ask, uh, so to, to member uh, Baker, so one other thing to think about is, you know, developers do have the option of providing um, housing on their site. Mm -hmm. So um, something, if you really want to make sure that it happens in your district, you can also encourage our development partners to say, is there a way to incorporate this into your own project? And maybe um, that way, it's, it's a way of making sure that um, if you're concerned about that factor, that it all happens in the same area. Now, every development's different. People may not have room on their site to do that, but it is something that I know uh, Sheila, or, or pardon me, uh, Chief Dillon has talked about as a goal. Yeah, but I mean, a high rise, you know yourself, Yeah. how much per square foot, if we're going into, you know, if we're getting away from where those high rises are, or that new construction type building, and we're, we're going into a neighborhood where you might get more bang for your buck, is, 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 is I want to be open to. Thank you, Council Baker. I'll Thank you. Time. Uh, did you need to respond to that? No, just to commit that we will sit down with him in the next 30 to 45 days on this. Thank you. Council Braden, you have the floor. Working? Yes, yeah. I'm working. Good. Thank you for being here. Um, a few questions. Let's see. Um, I, I was looking at the. Um, the, 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 the contractual services um, expenses and your um, uh, money for personnel. Personnel, uh, personnel was 24.1 million and then contractual services was 24.4 million it, it, and the contractual services for planning studies and engineering design. It seems that you don't have the personnel capacity to do a lot of this in-house and that we need to change the equation a little. Um, and one big issue I have is, is your planning capacity. I, I know 
we have asked, um, Alston Brighton is the second largest district in the city. It's 75,000 residents uh, and growing fast. And we've never, ever had a planning study, like a district-wide planning study that's holistic in the sense of looking at projected populations, transit, uh, we, have food, <laughs> we have food deserts, um, you know, just, um, and, and then just the population balance. Uh, so what are your plans? I know you're three, two weeks on the job. I don't expect an answer, but uh, you know, I, I really feel this is a big problem. Well, through the chair to, um, uh, to Councilmember Breeden, I would say that um, this is probably our number one. I mean, from before I got here and, and sort of in, in every form of communication for the last uh, 60 days, I, I've been hearing about the gap in our ability to process the demand um, on uh, the demand on, on having projects reviewed. Uh, but I think I only highlight that to say, um, you know, the mayor's view is that there needs to be planning-led development review. And for us to reach a, a, a threshold where we actually have the level of planning support we need to actually cause that to be true, we need a huge surge of, of, of people uh, and personnel in order to, to get that to happen. Uh, we've lost uh, too many positions in this area. Um, and so it's our number one priority. We have, I mean, Devin can, can speak to this better than I can, but we've already posted a, a number of jobs. We uh, have, uh, are planning to do a much more intensive recruiting effort to bring people into those jobs. Um, and because planning is, if we're gonna have planning-led development review, we have to have enough planners to, uh, to drive the plan. Um, and then we, ha and I also wanna highlight something that uh, members of the team in planning have highlighted, which is just how much planning um, and planner energy and time goes into dealing with proposed development. Uh, because often development doesn't come in the door fully baked. It needs more thinking to, to take place. And planners are really a key part of the team that help work out some of those issues, whether they're design issues, um, sort of site plan issues, or transportation issues. So we have under, kind of, there's a underestimated how much time at, people need to actually, um, planners need to dedicate to making projects better. So it's a top priority. Sorry for the long answer. I'll give you back your time unless Devin wants to add something. The only thing I add is that we are hiring. We have 35 positions posted, and like Arthur mentioned, hiring is shop one, so we're out there looking for people to join the team, and now is a very exciting time to be on the team. We're, we're looking at how to do planning and development differently in the future of Boston, so we want people to come at the front row seat uh, with us, with you all, as we, as we uh, craft that future together. Thank you, and I'm excited at the prospect of having a more planning-led development process. Um, then the other, the other important piece of the work of, of the BPDA that we've tapped into as, as legislators and whatever is the, um, the uh, research uh, department and, and the pu great publications that you produce. Um, I was just wondering in terms of, uh, I think there was a prolific uh, production of reports when uh, in previous administrations, I think during uh, Menino's time there was 400, there was, in the space of 14 years, it was 435, and right now, I think we're, since 20, in the last year or so, there's about eight, and, and we rely on these uh, to help us get a sense of what's happening on the ground. Um, in terms of infrastructure, do you have the uh, capacity and the uh, resources to continue to deliver really good quality? And I don't mean like surface level analysis, but really, you know, getting into the weeds a little more on, on, on the reports. Michelle might have some more information on our research budget. I, would, I just want to promote uh, Alvaro and his team's work that they're, they're pretty well staffed at the moment. So, and I think the, we certainly intend to, but I know Michelle get an okay. additional so viewpoint. I, I, I'm sorry, I would also add for the Office of Workforce Development, we also uh, use area schools, uh, Northeastern, um, Dukakis Center, we work with them closely on um, releasing up-to-date quarterly labor market data that gets to the job vacancies for the residents who don't have a bachelor's degree. We, we're in conversations with uh, the Boston Fed on policies that, and research that impacts low-wage workers. Um, we have many researchers around the country, particularly in Boston, 
that focuses on uh, randomized control studies and also constant surveys to find out what's on the ground and what impacts low-wage workers um, so that we can draft policies and improve programs that meet the constant needs of the residents. So that is always ongoing. I apologize if that wasn't um, very uh, visible in the, on the website. Yeah, but I think those other resources are great to know about as well. When it comes to our research department, I believe it was FY19 that we added two staff. Um, they have been instrumental in providing research support to the mayor's office during the pandemic 19 crisis. They focused very heavily on those weekly updates. Um, and I've been in conversation with Alvaro thinking about um, between the work that we are doing um, contesting the census um, and some of the other critical projects that are going on, how we might prioritize going forward. Um, so I'd be happy to uh, share this feedback or discuss more if there's additional reporting that would be helpful. Very good, thank you. Uh, let's see, um, research questions. The other institutional master plans and, and the challenges, I know we have a lot of our big, we have the eds and meds and we have sort of a perfect storm. Next year we're going to have a lot of impact um, of institutional master plans coming up for review. Um, one critical area of concern for us in Alston Brighton is we have a huge number of, we have three universities, we have a huge number of students from those universities and others who live in our neighbourhood and you know, we have 153,000 students living in, studying, enrolled in Boston. Um, like, how can we get to a place of balancing that pressure on our housing stock of students and, and, and putting more, having a more constructive partnership in terms of housing policy for housing more students on, on campus? Or do we need to actually start thinking about, like Berkeley did, um, start thinking about um, enrollment caps? Through the chair to uh, Member Breeden, I would say um, all of the above is a, is a, I hope is an appropriate answer. I mean, I think the, the institutional master plans give us an opportunity to have a very direct and transparent discussion with our institutions about what our expectations are, uh, the impact that they're having on the uh, local housing market. Um, and I think we intend to uh, use it as a way to look very closely with them. Uh, again, these are some of the leading institutions in the United States in many cases. I'm sure that they'll have ideas above and beyond the two or three that you and I have talked about now about how to resolve that. I think my immediate focus, if you pardon me for being very mundane, is having enough horsepower or people power to, to actually engage those plans as fully as they should be engaged. Um, but you should hear from us that we share your concern about the impact they're having on the housing market um, and, the, uh, and believe as you do that um, the institutional master plans are a great way for us to get, uh, to deploy any and all of the solutions that make sense to us. I, I think the horsepower, <laughs> the, the people power, the horsepower um, analogy is very, people. very important. We, we, I know there's a, very, there's a few people in our district who focus on the institutional master planning process and um, it's getting, in, it's intense work and, and um, you know, making sure you have the capacity to, to really do a good job on that is, and not just give our institutions a free pass is really important. Um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing was made effective in March of 2021. Um, you know, how, how, one question is um, when projects come up before, um, for in, in planned development areas, uh, is getting those developers to submit their aff affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, reports and making sure that they're complying with that because it's sort of it's a new thing and it's sort of this sort of this notion of they're grandfathered in they don't have to submit it yet but really if we're really serious about affirmatively furthering fair housing we can't be letting them have a pass on this and it has to be an important component especially in our district a lot of developers favor doing single and studios and single one bedroom housing units uh, over more um, family, suitable f housing for families and amenities for families. So I think that's something I'd just like to flag up as, as an important mm -hmm. um, 
um, an important thing to watch for and to make sure that uh, that the assessments that are submitted are adequate and that they don't just uh, not check all the boxes, that they really pay, pay attention. Um, and then the income certification process for the IDP units, the rental waitlist, um, after the Fair Housing Commission conducts the housing lottery for initial occupancy, um, then currently prospective tenants have to contact each individual building one by one. Uh, the management office or the leasing office to inquire about um, availability or to get on the waiting list. Um, is, there a, and is, can we, is there ways that we can think about streamlining that process? Um, and, you know, how can we, um, and what's the nature of the agreement between the BPTA uh, facil um, facilitating this program on behalf of the city? Like, how does that, how does that work? When it comes to how they, I know, so Councillor, you may know this, prior to my coming to this role at the BPDA, I worked for Sheila Dillon in the Department of Neighborhood Development, now Mayor's Office Housing, so I know something about the way that the lotteries were run for um, affordable housing units that are created off-site, which is through the Fair Housing Office. I believe that's also the case for IDP units, although I'm not an expert on the IDP units, so I'd have to get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I think just we need to dig a little deeper into the, and to streamline the process so that folks don't get lost and uh, that we we deliver those affordable housing units in a timely process, timely way. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Bach. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, picking up on AFFH, um, I feel like we uh, have really given you with the zoning amendment and the policy and the BIFTIC, um like kind of a sword in a stone there, but I feel like it's still in the stone. Um, and I guess a, a couple of questions. So, and, and I think just to like, conceptually it was based on the Green Building Committee. It was the same idea of like, we all share responsibility for a new thing, which is like a greener city of Boston, uh, a less segregated, more inclusive city of Boston. And so instead of saying that everyone's responsible for something that they did, it's instead like we all share this thing that we need and we need to do something proactive, right? And so, and I feel like what you've seen is the Green Building Committee get much more aggressive about what its standards are over its 10 years or whatever of existence. And I think basically what we need is for the, the Interagency Fair Housing Committee to do the same thing, but on a much shorter timeline. Like I don't think we have 10 years for it to sort of find its footing and realize its powers and like whatever, like we kind of need it to do that now. The good news is I actually think you have now in statute a lot of the powers that would be helpful. So an example I wanted to give. Um, we, we right now, we know that actually a lot of our IDP units do get used by lower income um, folks who are using housing vouchers. So we have a lot of doubled up subsidy. Um, I, a significant number of our buildings have landlords who will tell a tenant who comes with a voucher that could actually afford the market rate rent of the building, oh no, you can only use that in the affordable units. I think we have a ton of our landlords who are miseducated about source of income discrimination um, uh, prohibitions. And that's another issue that the council's raised with fair housing and there's all kinds of testing, et cetera, we can do. But one of the things that we were kind of thinking of with the fair housing tools and, and what, what we're gonna get to people to commit to up front was when we talk about kind of the marketing options in that implementation list, like having folks actually proactively say, yes, I'm not just gonna rent to people with vouchers because technically I'm legally required to, even though maybe I don't know it, um, but I'm actually going to like sort of proactively make my systems work for voucher holders. I'm not, for instance, going to fill an apartment so fast that a voucher tenant can't have their inspection done in the time permitted, right? Or like. I, you know, there's just there's a bunch of things. I'm not going to run credit checks on people whose rent is backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government. I think there's like a bunch of things that the BPDA could do to actually help unlock the market rate rentals that we're approving to these lower income folks in addition to the IDP units. And I think that would make a huge difference for affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, and But it means that the BPDA needs to work really closely with the BHA on understanding that, and on thinking about how you monitor that, how you make that real. I also think that, um, and I'll say this to the IDP technical folks at some point as well, um, but I think that in addition to wherever we land on IDP, it would be huge if we also move towards having a tranche of apartments in any residential building where 
we simply asked folks to commit to keeping them below this payment standard because since we switched to small area fair market rents at the BHA, our payment standards are quite high and they're very close to real market, but the new buildings that come online tend to be a bit above the average because they're new. And so it could literally be a very shallow subsidy commitment where we're asking people to have the rents 500 bucks lower than they would be they're otherwise getting market rents, but then we've got low-income folks coming into it. So I mentioned some of those ideas just to say that I think that's the type of thing that the BIFDIC could be asking building owners to talk about and commit to up front that we're not asking them to do. In addition to, there's a bunch of harder housing creation asks and built into the BIFDIC, right, that imagine like that you might actually, you know, partner with the BHA on public on, on project-based vouchers, or you might grab land and do some sort of thing, or like you were saying, Arthur, you might, um, you know, repurpose part of your space. So I, ju I just really want to emphasize that I think it would be great for that to be on your, like, soon list, not your sort of, like, one-year list of things to kind of really get your arms around, because I think a lot of what we hope to see in terms of a more, like, how's our people focused planning policy, there's, like, the seeds of it are already there. Mm -hmm. um, We'd also love to hear if you guys have started thinking about expediting affordable of housing review at all in Article 80. I, I mean, in a small way, we helped with this with lifting the parking minimums on affordable housing. That was obviously a partnership between the agency and the council last year, but I'm wondering whether there's been any thought to just, we do have this review backlog, it feels like, and I would love to get the affordable housing projects to the front of the line. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Thank you, Councillor. Those are all excellent thoughts and I really, again, appreciate your advocacy on uh, behalf of affordable housing in our city. Um, a couple thoughts. Uh, one, those are all great ideas. Again, just want to come to this body with the spirit of all ideas around the table. We really want to hear uh, how we can incorporate them into our, into our thinking as the new team gets started. I think one thing that immediately comes to mind with those, that set of ideas is where in the regulatory process might they be embedded? Are these things that are in zoning? Are these things that are in cooperation agreements? Are these things that are um, part of the new IDP policy? Like I think how they, as we, if we could, I think sit down and sort of hash out how to operationalize into the different regulatory tools that the BPDA has, how to, how to make that happen. I think that'd be a really exciting and productive conversation. Um, and on the question of, are, are we considering uh, expediting affordable housing? Uh, permitting, the answer is yes, uh, and uh, Chief Dillon's team has uh, uh, started a work group on this that we were invited to last week. I think it would, I think it overlapped with one of our Arthur's first onboarding conversations. So we couldn't make it the very first meeting on it, but that has started, and, our, and a team of uh, BPDA staff will be working together, and I'm sure it will be before this council uh, relatively soon to talk about how, how, to, how to actually make that real while also you know, incorporating community feedback and design review and the important, thing, important things we st still want to do with affordable housing but to get it done quickly because we know we're in a housing crisis and we know we need to deliver as, as fast as possible. Yeah, we need all, all hands on deck and all levels. And I mean, I also would love to see the BPDA sort of and the city partnering to sort of create a housing corporation. And this is all part of the conversation maybe for the land um, study and such. So more to come. Um, I. I just want to also emphasize vis-a-vis -vis research. Alvaro's team is amazing. In our AFFH work, they were amazing. Um, the, you know, we're very antsy about the state's proposal vis-a-vis -vis the Hines, and I'm very concerned about the sort of open heart surgery um, on the Back Bay kind of Fenway South End uh, business ecosystem over there um, and the number of jobs on the line. Um, I do really... I, I am really interested in the BPDA research folks playing a role in us getting our arms around that problem um, kind of like quickly and aggressively so that we can help lead this conversation and not sort of end up in a state governor's departure checklist space. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that even in that context, I have really no interest at all in us considering a hotel to dorm conversion of an adjacent building before we've even figured out what's happening with the Hines. I feel like when we talk about planning-led development, the idea of sort of like not putting the cart before the horse and really figuring out what we're doing here is really important. So I don't know, Arthur, if you had any thoughts on the Hines and how the agency can help. Um, I have, through the chair to uh, Member Buck, I have some thoughts. I think uh, it's really the kind of thing that we, am I okay to finish answering this one or I can stop? 
Um, it is the kind of thing where it really does require a little bit more of a huddle internally than uh, has been completed, but I did note that the, uh, the economic development bill was filed uh, at the end of last week. Um, I think what, you, what we are discussing is identifying a set of expectations for uh, a site like that. Um, one of the, just to explain what's happening, there's a, as I understand it at least, uh, there's a bill that would authorize the state to sell that property to a third party. Um, and when, once sold, it would go through a Article 80 like process and then have, um, you know, it would be subject to city zoning and things like that. Um, I think the real immediate challenge there is making sure that uh, the buyer does not develop such expectations about the development of the site that it, that it can't really have a multi-layered uh, use to the to the city, um, meaning that in, it, in our regulatory review of whatever's proposed, there isn't enough uh, planning room there for there to be the things that benefit the city to be achieved. So I think what we are focused on now is uh, identifying those broad expectations uh, as a way to help whoever wants to buy the property understand what will be expected of them when they enter a regulatory process, which is the first part of a planning process. We've got to run quickly to, to get there on the basis of good research. Um, so um, that's something that's at very high on my list. Yeah, and I look and forward lots to further further Earlier than soon. Yep, absolutely. And I look forward to discussing it together. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the BPDA for being here and answering some of our questions. So um, I, my first question is going to be about uh, supplier diversity and vendor diversity within the BPDA. Um, you stated that you could delve more into that, and I'd, li and I'd like you to, I believe the stats were that at the time that the disparity study was done, I believe more than 20% of the MWBEs, of the contractors with MWBEs. Um, I'm curious to know where that number is right now. Um, and I'm also curious to know whether we can have uh, that data broken down, and, and if we do, uh, apologies, but if we could have that broken down by the, you know, pe folks of color, business of color, um, to the demographic level data that we have available, um, and how many of those are women-owned businesses. And then uh, piggybacking off of that, all related here, um, is where, like, what, are they in the top 20% of our, you know, uh, you know, contractors? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. I have another question related to this. Um, so in May 21, we passed our equitable procurement plan. It's, um, it sits with the board now and requires me as a CPO to monitor and report on a variety of actions. We did attempt to uh, break that plan into five key areas of focus um, with outreach and data tracking being two kind of key areas that we knew we needed to improve upon. We had participated with the city's disparity study. So over the same time period, the city spend was 2.2 billion. Our spend was 52 million. It's also important to note that uh, in the and beginning- of, I guess of that 52 million, do you know how much of that went to MWBs? Yes, it was 23%. It was almost entirely women-owned entities. Once you peel those three contracts apart, it was United, Elevator, Coastal Marine, and I believe McKay. Once you pull those three contracts out, severe disparities across the board, both for BRA and EDIC spending. So we know that at any particular time, there's an ebb and flow. Right now, we happen to be at 20%. We happen to- And is that dependent still on those three big contracts? Yes, primarily. However, we've seen multiple um, uh, black-owned businesses come online in the past 12 months, and we're, uh, you know, trying to get the data out there in a friendly and consumable way. Um, so we are did. Those, are those like what, what level of contracts are we talking about when we're talking about the, the black-owned businesses that are vendors? That are we are finding success in areas like landscaping yep. and general repair and maintenance. Um, so uh, primarily providing services in the marine park. Um, we've also uh, focused quite a bit. We, we have some ebbs and flows in our capital construction projects. We're in a heavy design phase right now. Um, so we've been working really hard um, to get more designers on board. 
Um, and so, you know, I think going forward, yes, our biggest challenge is we want to maintain the relationships that we have. We have niche providers, we have niche needs, uh, we have an awful lot of waterfront infrastructure, and so to have white-owned entities that are able to do this work, sorry, women-owned entities that are able to do this work, we still want to hold on to them, um, but it is clear that we have much further to go in creating um, supplier diversity across the board for both entities. Got it. So I'm wondering what, from the mass port model, um, have, has the BPDA been able, because they've seen success, they've yes. seen success in getting uh, black businesses and getting lucrative Indeed. black businesses. I think it's important that we're, that, you know, we're doing the landscaping, because someone has a landscaping company in, in Roxbury, like, that's great. I think yes. that is, and we need to be upping the level of technical assistance that we give to folks in our neighborhoods yes, to be able to become vendors and contractors with uh, the BPDA and to get the MBWE certification. So not knocking that at all, that is very important to have that entry. But I think there's a lot we can learn from what's been done. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Yes, ma'am. We um, have been working in the land disposition space. I know Devin can speak about that a lot. We have been working to bring diversity plans into our 30B procurements, which is a a bit of gymnastics, um, but we are trying to make sure that we're uh, narrowly tailoring our projects. And so if there's downstream suppliers, diversity plans are super important. Um, if it's the scenario where it's direct service, diversity plans can sometimes prevent people from participating in the process. And so we don't want it to be a burden, um, but we have worked very closely um, with the real estate department and the land disposition space. Um, so Devin, I don't know yeah. if, if we have time for comment on that. Then I would just say briefly that I think this is, this is uh, diversifying our spend is critically important to advancing our mission. And as a real estate entity, this is, this is it's, it's ultimately a passion area for a lot of our staff members. Um, we have tried to lead uh, on the, uh, with, when we're doing real estate disposition RFPs to, similar to Massport, uh, including as one of our four selection criteria, diver diversity, equity, inclusion as one of the deciding factors as to which team we're going to work with when developing public land. And where do you require, in what projects do you require the diversity that's, plan? All, all, oh. all, all real estate dispositions. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's been our policy since 2018. Since tw 2020, we've rated that at 20, no less than 25% of the overall evaluation criteria of who we're going to work with. And I'm happy to send you more information on this offline, but we have about 16 developments that we've awarded during that time period, all of which have significant diversity inclusion plans. And what's, I think, important about that list is that it includes development at a lot of different scales. So we have some very small infill housing type projects, some, some affordable housing developments, and now some very large life science development in the marine park, some very large commercial development in Roxbury, that it, so that's helping establish a pipeline for growing minority-owned businesses and growing the overall diversity of the real estate economy in Boston. Thank you. I think it's really important, you know, um, you all know the reputation of the BPDA, BRA, and about it acting as a force, what it's doing to communities. Um, and I think that's amplified even more when we look at, you know, when you peel those diversity numbers and see what's actually happening. Um, so it's really important for, you know, in the areas where the BPDA is trying to self-correct and get things right, I think it, this is a really, really important area, especially when folks are already upset oftentimes that development is happening um, in their communities and they feel like their voice hasn't been heard, like, it, you know, the BPDA is, you know, working hand in hand with the developer. Um, then, then you also see the vendors who come on the projects and the vendors don't look like you, right? And the contract, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think it's just uh, an important area for us to continue, uh, for the BPDA to continue really like le leaning in and doing the work. Um, uh, another question I have is regarding uh, the job trust, the allocation in the, uh, in the linkage fees. Um, uh, so like the trust is replenished with linkage fees paid by developers. Um, and one of the things I think that's important to workforce development that I don't know how much we talk about it um, is uh, language access and, and English language learners. So I was wondering what, um, what do you see the role of uh, the Neighborhood uh, Jobs Trust in contributing to um, English language, uh, English as a second language classes, especially because there's a very long wait list in the city of Boston. Um, for those classes. So like, how do you think about that in the Office of Workforce Development? 
for our migrant populations. Thank you, uh, thank you, Council, for that important question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you had um, stated the difference with the linkage law, which we have two housing, and this is uh, relevant to the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust. Um, adult basic education at ESOL remains one of the highest priority uh, for the mayor and for the city and for the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust. Um, and so what we do is work closely with the state. They have a al direct allocation of 9.7 million to 25 uh, community-based groups uh, serving 3,000 Boston residents. You said this is the state, alloc the state allocation? This is the state allocation mm -hmm. directly to community-based partners in the city, and we work closely with them. Although we don't have direct funding, we utilize and leverage our dollars to help provide TA where the state does not provide funding for. So for example, we provided $2 million of Chromebooks and also updated uh, professional development staff for teachers of ESOL so that they can continue a hybrid approach to doing and conducting ESOL and ABE classes. Um, we've also done assessments because the state has um, uh, required hybrid and online tests for HiSET and the residents are not necessarily equipped for it. So we provide a year long of we free Wi-Fi and Chromebooks so that they can um, obtain the tests uh, from the state. And so there's a variety of reasons and uh, projects and research that we've uh, worked with the state on. Happy to follow up with you online on the ongoing efforts. But um, by no means that is going to answer any questions um, and solve immediate problems. But it is a priority, and we are working closely with the state to ensure that we're leveraging both city dollars, state, and federal dollars as well. Thank you, Trim. Is that am I in time? Yes. OK. Thank you. Do you want one more minute? Uh, one more question regarding language access okay. for the BPDA. Um, so. You know, I, I just think it's really important that we just have to do a better job of including all of our communities, our immigrant communities, and sometimes I'm on these BPDA hearings and you're hearing these translations and you're like, what is, what is, is this the language that I know, right? Um, and so I, my questions are, my question about this is, um, how does the BPDA establish when to do a special language and communication access for a plan for certain neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. And do you depend on the city's LCA division for translations? Um, and yeah, how do you set those policies and how do we make translations better when it comes to development, both translation and outreach? Because oftentimes the word for word translation, that is that does not work, right? Okay. There needs to be a lot more comprehension and a lot more, You it can't just be a translator that shows up one day. Um, I, I just think it's really important for us to do a better job at relaying information to our immigrant communities and oftentimes that's not a word for word translation. Yeah, and I think something that's absolutely critical to us, counselors, is making sure that we're actually able to reach every, 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 every person in the city, every community in the city in the, in the language that's most appropriate to them. But to answer your question specifically, we now have a language access policy um, that we've had for a, a little over a year now. Happy to share that with you. We're, we are about to hire a new language access coordinator. That language access policy sets out pretty firmly what, based on the demographics of the neighborhood, what uh, translation and um, interpretation must be available as a part of any community process that we're holding. I think, we're, we're, I think we've come a long way in that, that that is now in writing and now a firm policy that we have. I think you're highlighting that we, yes, we have a long way to go to where we're actually achieving our goal of reach, reaching every community member in an, an authentic and an easily understood way. And that's something as we hire um, a new diversity, a director of diversity, equity, inclusion, and a director of con, uh, community engagement that is front and center for what those roles, uh, this uh, important objectives for those roles. So we'd, we would absolutely love to uh, sit down with you more and talk about how to make that a reality. Thank you, and I just also urge that you also work with community groups because this is a group. This is a concern that I've heard, a gripe that I've heard from community groups um, of all stripes and of all cultures. So thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to ask that additional question. I appreciate it. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for all for being here and welcome. Um, I do want to start by saying everyone on the ninth floor has been extremely helpful and supportive in my first six months here in City Hall, so thank you for that. I always like to go right up to the top floor. <laughs> um, 
So it's great that you're here. Um, I'm going to focus on workforce development and I just actually left a great conversation with Marissa Kelly, the president of Suffolk University, and we were talking about workforce development and the changing landscape with life sciences and different careers coming online. And as you probably know, I come from the early childhood world and she comes from the higher ed world. And our conversation was around you know, that understanding that we can't wait until kids are in middle school or high school or young adults to say, oh, here's some supports, we have to start early. I knew that as a kindergarten teacher, that you know, when we start early, we're gonna have better results. And I don't think we're doing a great job yet of starting early, it's more like react when we see that there's groups or certain individuals who need support. So um, what are we doing to support that earlier and like what can I do to help you? Get that out there. Chief, may I answer that? Um, thank you, Counselor. Um, that's a great question. We, you know, I would defer the K to 12 space to Boston Public Schools. I'm sure they have many programs. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is provide complementary or what we call integrated um, programs so that it would help boost early college education, dual enrollments, as, as you know. Um, the mayor had launched uh, 12 new sites at the high schools for dual enrollment, which mm -hmm. our schools have, for, for a variety of reasons, never taken advantage of. Um, and so what we did also use is linkage dollars to provide tuition-free community college for all students in the city. I mean, when developments are happening and beautiful buildings are happening, we redirect that wealth to stu direct impact for students. So. Um, all tuition, uh, three up to three years, um, tuition, mandatory fees, supportive services, a variety of things, coaches, we pay for that out of linkage. Um, and so we do support post-secondary education. Um, and then on the employers and the jobs side, we've had many uh, conversations um, with the planning department, uh, developers, even anchor in institutions um, that when uh, employers are doing business within the city, they should sign on to a value statement stating that they want good quality jobs for the residents mm -hmm. and that we have a good pipeline of various training, supportive services, and post-secondary education that links an employer to all of the jobs in the supply chain, not just those who have graduate degrees or BAs. Um, so we've had those constant conversations and obviously the training dollars are never enough so we leverage that with the federal uh, government, USDOL, uh, the uh, higher education funding, Pell Grants as you know, um, state uh, funding as well. But uh, more importantly, we really link employers to graduates and internships and also those who um, are graduating with those d d disciplines into the jobs that are available. Um, we have a lot more to do, but uh, those pipelines and uh, career tracks are definitely uh, our priority. Are you collecting data or is it too soon? Because I often hear in the labor world also that there's jobs they want and they offer internships and opportunities for our BPS kids, but oftentimes they start and they're just not prepared to succeed and I, we're failing them, right? And I know you said we have to push back on BPS, but we do know the data is there that they're not doing a great job at preparing our students if they're coming out of a Boston public school to be prepared for this type of great work that's here in the city. So how can we maybe partner with that or if there's data you have that we can push back on to the schools to align the curriculum, start earlier? Yes. I mean, we are working um, with administrative data, with MOUs, with the state, um, community colleges. As you know, we pulled them in because they can go to scale um, here to help us with workforce development um, and then leveraging the Pell dollars for low-income students. Um, and so we're, we are putting those um, data agreements together to track and collect uh, data for students in completions, but uh, you're right, we, we have to do a better job with our schools to really, uh, you know, uh, 
document and track outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. That hasn't been easy, but uh, we are having those hard conversations with our partners. And before my time's out, I will lift up my colleague, Councillor Worrell, and I myself and Councillor Flaherty joined in, I don't know if you saw his cradle to career initiative that we're working on with him, but that idea of if we wait too long and that data, collecting the data from birth and seeing at what points are these kids falling off or when are they successful. So let's learn from our wins and share that and then also learn from when we're not doing a great job to strengthen and give the supports when needed. I, I know the chief has, has made a, a, a good priority and value statement that planning and development in the city is about people in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. and where they're at and the quality, quality of life and not just skyscrapers and buildings going up. And so as he's taking on that helm, he will be including a lot of these value statements and quality of life indicators into how we plan and build this city for everyone. Well, that's exciting. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Chief, it's great to meet you. Congratulations. Look forward to working uh, with you, and we're all excited uh, about your arrival. Um, I do want to just shout out incredible individuals in the BPDA that I've gotten a chance to work with over the years. Um, Joe Cristo, Jared Staley, Christina Riccio, Jay Ruggiero, Mike Christopher, Teresa Polymus, um, Ted Schwartzberg, Alvaro Lima, Chris Breen, Rich McGinnis, and Devin. Thank you so much for your work. Um, Chief, I'm happy to hear you talk about moving away from a parcel by parcel approach and having planning dictate development rather than the other way around. Um, I'm also happy to hear that you are pushing for um, more personnel and planners to help with this initiative. Um, and looking at the top 10% of earners, it's still um, disheartening to see that 75% of them are white. So I know that we have a lot of work to do in, in this space. Um, and my question is, I mean, only because I've heard anecdotally, we are not competitive in terms of salary when it comes to major development corporations. And I think a lot of what we can do is just pay people what they deserve, right? We've lost a lot of talent over the last couple of years um, to these major development corporations. So I'm wondering if you're doing an analysis of the levels of, or um, the salary levels that you're providing for planners and project managers and comparing them to some of the other um, salary levels that others are providing. Um, th through the chair to uh, Member Kawaita, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'd actually like to ask Devin to say a few words about the salary study we were, uh, we were uh, planning to embark on and then I'll add something after that if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, thank you, Councillor. And so the answer, the quick answer is yes. This is, I think you know, you've heard about the job one is capacity and it's really important for us to bring people onto our team to achieve the day-to-day -day work of the agency and all the, all the bigger and better work we want to do together. Um, but we can't do that without, without, without people. Mm -hmm. um, we know there are a couple of things holding us back uh, from being able to uh, hire and retain great people. One is the overall economy, and we can't change that, right? That's, that, that's it's a tough hiring market in the United States right now. Um, but the, uh, the second thing is pay. Uh, and we know we are not paying in line with the market. And, and in fact, in some places, we're not even paying in line with other municipalities that are mm -hmm. local, right? And, it, and it's and sort of devastating to lose a great planner who wants to, who would, who would prefer to stay but can just make 10% more moving to a different municipality. Yeah. So um, we are absolutely going to correct that. We are, we are contracting now with a firm to do a class and compensation study. That study should be done by the end of the summer and that should immediately affect um, how we're able to both post jobs but also affect re retention rates as well. We will, we will adjust salaries uh, based on that data. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning the third issue which is that there's, I think there's maybe perhaps a little skepticism in the marketplace about whether now is the time to join the BPDA in a moment of transition. I think right. and Arthur and myself and I, I think the entire team want to emphatically say now is the time. In fact, it is the best time uh, to join the team and be part of shaping a planning and development for the next generation of Boston. So we're really excited to get that recruiting message out there. The mayor herself uh, was uh, campaigning with that exact um, message on social media over the past week. So I want to ask the council members uh, assistance and if you know great people who might want to join our team we'd, we'd love to we'd love to meet them and, uh, and recruit them thank you 
through, through the chair, I would only add, um, Devin covered all the HR matters very well. I would just add one other thing, which is, um, I, I don't think I said this uh, earlier, but I did want to make sure you, you heard it. So um, as we are beginning to have conversations with um, developers about the plan being the guiding document, you know, we're, we need all the hands and voices we can get to do that. Um, so I guess I would just ask this body and members of it, uh, as plans be, are articulated and, and moving forward, and developments come to the front uh, and say, I'd like to, well, I, I like the plan, but maybe I'd like it to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be helpful uh, if, uh, if, as you're considering the arguments, you're remembering that that's the direction we're trying to go because we're going to need all of our, uh, all the members of this body to help us echo that because uh, your voices are very important in the ears of uh, the development interests that present. So it's, it's going to take a village to mm -hmm. get plans to matter uh, the way that they should and to guide the way they should. Uh, we're going to do our end, and that will be calling on you to help us as well. Yeah, I look forward to that work. I mean, the number one thing that I've heard from all stakeholders is just predictability. Right? Mm -hmm. We have those guardrails up. So that when developers, I think of bowling, um, so I'm a very visual person. When developers bowl, they know exactly what they're going to get, and they they stay in the lane that they're supposed to. So, um, look forward to that, and thank you for that answer. I'm happy to hear that. Um, we're going to be paying people hopefully more money after this this study. Cool. Um, when it comes to plans, just in, in particular, are do we have any timelines as to when Plan East Boston in Charlestown will be completed? Respectfully. Did you say Alston or in Charlestown? Or uh, Plan East Boston and Charlestown. Right. So um, I had a very intense briefing earlier this week, last week, about Charlestown. Uh, we're reaching a pretty important inflection point there. Um, I know a little bit less about Eastie because we haven't had the, pardon me, East Boston, because uh, we haven't had the um, briefing there. Uh, but I expect us to sort of, you're going to see us in the next 30 to, to 60 days back out on Charlestown engaging people in the community about what the plan is. Um, there's a lot of, I would also say that maybe without giving you a direct answer because I don't have it yet, I would also say that we are very aware of a range of development proposals that are very wide ranging and far reaching. And we would like, if we like to have planning led development review, mm -hmm. we've got to get that plan out there in a way that allows the guidance of those, the of development review of those projects. So we feel a lot of um, pressure and have prioritized that with our staff limitations is very highly because we need to help. That's a place where we can actually have planning lead the development conversation. Uh, yeah. Devin, I know you're a Charlestowner. In case you want to add anything um, to that comment, the, the only thing that I'd add it's it's great to have, have you representing our neighborhood now, Councillor. Devin wants to be able to walk down Essex Street without anybody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll leave that there. Yeah. Um, Okay, and does anybody want to give any specifics to AFFH? I just want to underscore Councilor Box push to get that up and running. I know that there are 16 projects in the pipeline. Are there any success stories that you want to highlight here? Anything that we've been able to extract from that process? I know that everything is in limbo, but I would love to hear, having worked on this with Councilor then, Councilor Edwards and Councilor Bach, um, I just would love to hear how it's going from your perspective. Through the chair to uh, Member Coletta, I, I'm just coming up to speed on it. Mm -hmm. I know about federal AFFH. I don't know as much about it at the local level. Uh, I might ask my colleagues who have been working through the process to say more. I, I, I would, because as you know, Councilor, I've been the director of real estate here for the past three years. I've been a little less directly yeah. involved in the AFFH, AFFH but I'm, I'm, I think it is a national leading program. I think there's been, a, I think, a lot of other communities are looking to Boston's leadership here, and, and this, council, this council did a lot of work to, to put that program together. So while I don't have any stories at my fingertips to share with you, I think those do exist, and I think we should be all sharing them together. Is Michelle McCarthy still um, yes, in charge? She is. Okay, great. Some follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. Um, when I look at your website, I, and, and read your mission statement, it states you, in partnership with communities, the BPDA plans Boston's future while respecting its past. Can you speak to your community process and how you're doing this? Um, you know, through, 
through the chair to, um, you're the chair of this meeting. So I get, to, sorry for my formalities, I've worn that over many years. Appreciate you, um, thank you. No sweat. The, um, we have a community engagement section um, of the agency whose job it is to, I think, enhance the existing community process. But there's a number of statutory and regulatorily required um, processes related to um, the review of projects uh, where community meetings are required. I think the vision, at least, is that the community engagement team is supposed to work in concert with the, um, I know it has a different name, um, but what used to be Office of Neighborhood Services in the Mayor's Office to make sure that uh, the communities are fully uh, aware of the ongoing processes associated with reviewing development projects. Um, I also uh, know that there's IAGs um, that are uh, formed to deal with publicly owned land and that there are um, you know, further through neighborhood plans. For those at home, what is an IAG? Um, it's an advisory group. I forget the, the meaning of the I. Impact, thank you. Impact thank advisory you, Councilor. Group. So what is the uh, um, impact advisory Impact group? advisory groups are formed around, I believe, city-owned property, city or um, BPDA-owned land, so there can be a particular level yeah. of input. I would invite people to correct me if yeah, I that, and I, So it was second week on the job, Chief. I'll help, you, help you out a little bit. A, a project review committee is for publicly owned land. Pardon. And a, a, a impact advisory group is part of the article 80 process for private development that advises on the uh, there you on go. The impacts of the project. First time, first mistake ever. <laughs> Actually, got a plaque. I, um, I, I don't know that. Though. But no, it's important though. Citizens no, I was know that. Joking, I don't know that that was your first mistake. But. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well done. So I, the, how, do you know how the MOH, Mayor's Office of Housing, uh, previously ND is advised or is reaching the community on the process? Okay. Uh, on which process are you referring to? Any, any engagement in terms of any any development that's going. On. So, uh, having previously worked at DND, I would say there's a community engagement is a core principle for for Chief Dillon's team. Um, I would it, it depends on what type of, and I guess the type of project depends on the type of engagement. So public land dispositions that do a lot of similar work to uh, our real estate team. Is it by team. email? So they do the, oh, the actual mechanism by which we get information out. So yeah, there is, the how. yeah, certain, there is flyers, there is emails, there is, and you know, sometimes staff here. MOH and, flyers the communities. I, I don't want to speak on behalf of MOH because I've, it's been three years since I've worked with them, so I don't know. I, certainly, three years ago, they certainly flyered communities. I suspect they continue to do so. We we do that on our at the BPDA. A lot of the concerns, and I know in. Um, Mr. Quirk, I, I have to thank you for being so responsive and always working with me. Um, I'm looking forward to our meeting with the Advisory Council. A lot of the issues that are presented by District 7, both South End and Roxbury, not just the Roxbury thing, not just the black thing, um, but a D7 thing. And the Advisory Council is, of all D7 leaders, white, black, and brown, everybody. And they're relieved to finally be able to be in concert, right? To be able to communicate with each other and be on one page. The issue is one, the community process that BPDA or if MOH is the responsible for facilitating or um, helping with engagement. And then the other issue is that folks always feel that they're playing catch up. So too many development, too many meetings, too many, just too many RFPs out. Um, and then there seems to be this rush for RFPs um, hmm. late, as of late. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, taking the last question first, I think the, the rush to RFPs really has to do with, we don't want to rush anything. I mean, the, the perception is rushed and we need to do better hmm. engagement. But if there is a perceived rush, it is because of, I think, our need and our, our mission to deliver public land for public good. We have this. We have this incredible resource, which is vacant land in some of our communities, and that should, and it shouldn't be vacant. It's it is that it's not it's not doing anything productive for our communities as vacant land. So that it's an opportunity for community gardens, for open space, for new affordable housing, for new market rate housing, for new new job creating projects, and it is really important to us to 
to move those productively forward. We have to do that in a way, and then we part of public land for public good is listening to communities and and, and um, developing it in a, with a shared vision. So we have to we have to be responsive to building that vision together. Um, but at the same time, we I think we all know there's a lot of engagement happening across all of our communities. So to work back to the sort of like overwhelming n nature of it all, I think that you know, yeah, Councillor Kletter previously used the word predictable, and that's something we've heard across the board if that is if there is that is that is one of the words that should drive the changes that we want to make to the agency to make things more predictable so that perhaps some things don't require the same level of community process so that we all sort of already have established what the what the outcome goals should be um, and we can trust that the system will deliver that uh, without the need for uh, you know many many nights at the community center or on zoom that's, a, that's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to get to, so I'm excited to work with you and, and, and members of the council to actually ach achieve that vision that the sure. mayor's put before us. I, I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you for that answer. Um, we want a full inventory of what's going on in D7 um, in terms of what stages they're, they're in, and if you could send that to me, that would sort of, I guess, um, save time and we want to be able to assess what the community needs. Without a proper asset mapping or deficit mapping, we're not able to actually tell you, yeah, you can put an affordable rental property over here, right? The issue is that we have about 75% of rentals in Roxbury and just about the same, almost, almost the same in South End. Seven, but then Roxbury's average income is $35,000 and getting lower as you get older to 60s, people are making an average of $19,000. If you get closer to 20s, then you're making an average about 40 uh, something thousand dollars. And then I talk about this a lot, the, the rate of, you know, um, we die 30 years faster, Roxbury, than Back Bay. And so this is due to climate injustice, this is due to poverty, this is due to the fact that we can pass generational wealth, the wealth gap, and so forth and so on. And so all of these lands that are now in Roxbury, Roxbury, District 7, both South Enders and Roxbury, do not want you, VPDA or anyone else, or any RFPs to go to developers that are going to build affordable rental. If you're going to build affordable rental, there's this huge pushback and they are now coordinating and organizing to push back because they believe that they, that Roxbury, black people deserve quality of life, that we deserve public land for public good, parks and urban farms and other types of spaces where we can go and decompress our stressors, not just affordable rental which further perpetuates poverty in our community. And so the problem with D7 is that all of these RFPs are out and they're going out fast and Roxbury and District 7 South End does not want them. And I know this because I sit with over 40 plus civic engagement leaders who tell me they don't want this because this is the general, the majority consensus in each civic engagement neighborhood groups. We know that, we're willing to do a survey to give you that response not developers, we're talking about people that are get displaced. So if it's public land for public good, then how are you ensuring that black people get housed when these developments go up? You can't, because then you'll say it's discriminatory, right? Well, isn't that the whole point? That you're trying to undo a harm that has been done? So I guess my final question, and I'll go back to my colleagues, is how are you, how, how does 70% AMI help District 7 if the AMI in Roxbury is 30? How does, if, how is deep, how, why are you calling it deeply affordable when it's 60% AMI? That doesn't make sense either. Why is this a thing and how will you ensure that Roxbury black people, and particularly because we know that they're at the bottom, are not being displaced when you're building and continue to build in D7. 
So there's a lot of questions there. I mean, we can go through them individually um, if, if you'd like. I mean, I think the, the challenge with AMI is, um, is that I think if I recognize your comment, you're saying AMIs are very high and relatively speaking, relative to Roxbury um, D7 incomes. Um, and so I, I, I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm, I'm listening. I don't want to presume, the, I think the notion you're saying is it should be lower um, if we're, we should target lower income households in uh, on D7 uh, BPDA on property. Uh, if, that's, if that's the input you're sharing with us, I definitely want to absorb that. Um, and the second question. I would add that it's the mm -hmm. input that you shared with us, mm -hmm. right, in your mission statement about making sure that you're working with community, public mm -hmm. land for public good. I agree with that. Um, so the, the second comment I gather was there was a question about as land is made available, um, or rather, should land be made available for affordable rental use? Um, and you were sharing that in talking with uh, your stakeholders and the groups that they represent, they've expressed real concern about more affordable rental being developed in the community. Um, and saying that there may be other uses like open space uh, or um, or gardens or um, other kinds of uses that might be more appropriate than um, than affordable rental. I just want to make sure that I'm hearing what you're saying. I think I am. But yes, and that Roxbury Black people deserve beautiful architecture and you know water parks and different other means of use, public use, um, public space use. Okay. Not just the bearing the burden, the responsibility of housing the unhoused of all of Boston. Got it. Um, I appreciate that point. It's been, uh, it's a point I'm very familiar with. Um, a lot of the city owned land is in Roxbury and in, in District 7, historically has been. And so um, this is a, 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 uh, a comment that I've heard before and I appreciate hearing it today. Um, this has been, at least for me, as a newer person to the dais, it's been great for me to hear this input. And I, you can be assured that in a follow-up meeting with you, we'll have a chance. I will be asking more questions to get better, uh, a better, uh, a better understanding of your view of uh, of how those public parcels should be developed. Thank you. I guess streamlining that pro that community process, creating the schedule so it's not duplicating, mm -hmm. it's not overlapping others community processes or meetings, and making sure that people are not feeling overwhelmed. I had a meeting mm -hmm. yesterday, now I'm going to this one, now there's one at night. There's yep. a lot of that going on too. Um, and I guess just in terms of your staff and top paid you know, salary earners, my colleagues, um, Council Coletta and Council Lujan mentioned this, but mm -hmm. you know, it's not enough to just say like, we haven't done a good job. I appreciate the procurement study, but I'm wondering, you know, if we can really be intentional and in understanding how many black people, how many brown people are you gonna hire out of these 35 positions available? Because now they should all be brown and black, right? Because that would be, that wouldn't even be equitable. No, it wouldn't because 40, out of 40 black people, you hire about 140 something whites. So then it's like, it's, you know what I mean? It's just really lopsided and I'm just, if we're gonna be intentional, these 35 positions, make sure they go to all black and brown people. Yeah, is that a promise? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I would argue that we should look beyond the 35. Yeah. I think that we should have a long-term vision and commitment to racial diversity up and down the supply chain of not just the BPDA, OWD, city agencies, but who we work with and who comes to do business in Boston. So, yeah, we love it. We'd, okay. We want to. Sounds like an almost promise. <laughs> I'll take that, Councillor Baker. Sure. Yes, you're next. It's okay. Flaherty Flynn Baker. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sorry. <sighs> Probably Devin. Um, <laughs> with with the um, Dorchester Bay City Plan over over at UMass, there there was. There was an effort to have a transportation sort of <clears throat> group convening regularly, and 
and um, I'd just like to know where that is. Is that group still convening between state stakeholders and, and the developers that were all in the area? Is that still talked about at all? I, I believe it is, Councillor. I think this is another, one of the one of those projects that I was not super familiar with as in my role as Director of Real Estate. Um, my Christopher and his team are briefing Chief Jemison and I on all the, the statuses of the of, of planning projects and all the large development projects in the city. So that's a, a, an answer we can get to you in short order. Well, the reason why I ask is because, <clears throat> you know, if we're planning um, to put I think it's six million square feet of development over there yep. between the point and Santander and all the other and the, all the other stuff with the vehicle traffic that's going to come in with the foot traffic that's coming in the area is in, it is has some challenges as far as transportation is going and, and my my concern is more about how do we the people that live in the neighborhood mm -hmm. how do we get from on the other side of the highway on the other side of the tracks how do we get over to everything that's good that's going that's happening and going to be happening at at the point so um, I, I'd like to know that we have a commitment there I'm, I'm trying to figure out what our commitments are they seem to be a moving target it, a absolutely so in terms of answering that question counselor that is ex absolutely something we can, 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 yeah, can yeah. commit to that's exactly what our role should be and able to convene a process and talk to you and others that this this is the the vision for that site this is, and how it aligns with the community process to date and where the project that's been proposed, where it matches and does not align with that vision. So I know we're, the, a scoping document's being put together currently that speaks to, I think it's a 40, 50 page document that says exactly that, like these are the, yeah, these are the because, issues, right? Because <clears throat> I'm in favor of the development going on that's over there, yep. but I'm not gonna be in favor of a development that happens and we don't do anything with Kosciuszko Circle, Marcy Boulevard, mm -hmm. you know, the resiliency piece that's happening there, we yep. have, we have money going into Moakley Park. That's that's been approved for a redo. There's supposed to be resiliency berms. There, yep. There's 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 a whole lot of different things happening yep. there. And and if we, we, I say we, if I can join in with you guys, if you guys will let me, I say we because if we're not there, kind of steering the whole thing, I think that will it, 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 there'll be something inadvertently that doesn't get taken care of that isn't that isn't um, talked about that isn't and hashed out and, and, and going right into that point there uh, um, so the projections in just that area there from Mary Ellen McCormick housing projects out to out to the point uh, JFK station the beat the projection is in 10 years or 15 years whenever fully built out there'll be an additional 150 million in tax revenue coming from that area. That those are all just projections. And I'm sitting here as a district city council. We mentioned already earlier that I, I had never even seen anyone's house painted in my neighborhood when I was growing up. No porches done over, whatever. You just didn't you didn't see it. The whole my whole neighborhood was poor, right? Like a lot of neighborhoods. Um, so how do I capture that? future revenue, there's part of me, and I've started talks with um, people that are all gone now about a, a transportation bond bill. You know, maybe we, maybe we get a $100 million bond bill that can go towards infrastructure improvements, and, 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 and I wanna talk more about how are we, the people living there, going to get across the train station, mm -hmm. across, how are we gonna get there? Less about the vehicles being able to come from point A to point B, most efficiently through my neighborhood. You know, is it, is it a transportation bond? Is it a, I know, um, I think the previous District 1 counselor did a, did a trust for, um, for, Tuffet Downs, mm. yep. the and I program. think I think Kenzie might have also done one. Can you talk to me about and, and, and when we say trust, trying to capture future future revenues, is that would that be similar to the South Boston Betterment Trust that, that that Jimmy Kelly floated probably 25 years ago or more? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the South Boston Betterment Trust. I'd be happy to look it up. Sounds important. Okay, but the um, just to mention the East Boston program, turn it over to Chief Johnson to respond. To the East well, maybe talk about the East Boston yeah. 
what that, do you see that actually happening? Are there legal challenges in there? Is that, can that happen? And if so, how does it happen? It's a, there's a, actually this program exists in a couple of different iterations, a couple of different places in the city. There, there, are, there are programs that exist to acquire existing market rate of uh, housing and convert it into long-term deed restricting housing to help preserve That's the people's lives. That's trust, it's all housing? Uh, yes, I believe so, if I'm, if I'm uh, talking about correctly. And it was, getting, word, getting it, was, from that. it was worded as housing yeah. also. It doesn't necessarily need to be all housing. Um, it, I mean, that program, I believe it does, but it doesn't mean that this couldn't be crafted in a different way. And a, another model that's in the Councilor Breeden's district is um, the, the, I believe it's called the Albright Ownership Fund, where the Austin Brighton CDC uh, uses a, a recycling pot of funds to purchase uh, uh, homes that are on the market uh, that are vacant. Uh, put a uh, how many deep, vacant homes are in are uh, just in people Brighton. who are moving out, like people, you know, home ownership units. The people who are moving out to compete with developers who might buy it and rent it, buy it, put an owner occupancy restriction on it, mm -hmm. and then resell it at a market rate, which is now slightly reduced. But now you know that, and, that there's going to be a, an owner living there rather than someone renting it out. So there's different. Uh, different models by which the um, the city is either participating or assisting with the participation uh, in the real estate market for social goods. Those are those are two examples. And if there's a way we can bring that uh, to Dorchester, that's something we yeah. Be, well, I mean, I, to I would like to go. I would like to go beyond housing. I would like to. I mean, because it's transportation issues there that we mm -hmm. you know. And and again, back to the person. My mother always said to me, if you're trying to get, if you're trying to figure something out, like walking someplace, pretend you walk, you, you, you're pushing a carriage. Yep. So can you get from point A to point B pushing a carriage yeah. without getting run over by a car? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, so that's a lot of the challenges that we have there. So what is our commitment moving forward to that area? Are we actively, and these are, you don't need to answer these, I'm just right. laying it out to you, probably more for you, Arthur, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for moving forward. Are we committed to real transportation trans transformation in, the, in that area. How do I, as a District 3 city councilor, capture that future revenue? You know, maybe this is a discussion that we can have when we, when we talk about the direct designation. Um, yeah, the trust. So. Can, go ahead, sorry. Pardon me, I, I thought you, I apologize. No, I'd like for you guys to talk sure. about the trusts and so, your thoughts on them and if they, if they are Sure. Are they legal? Can we do them? So, sure. So through the chair to, uh, to uh, Councilmember Baker. So I would say that um, the Betterment Trust was examined back in the late 90s and found not to be legal as it was proposed. Um, do you know why, Arthur? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the narrow answer to that. I think, you know, when it was held up to light that, you know, one neighborhood was going to benefit from the... Uh, the revenues of, of, a, of a part of that neighborhood and, the, and that that I mean, just something on the scale of what you've seen in the seat in the in South Boston waterfront so far it, it was it, it not only had legal issues there were sort of questions about whether that was fair to the rest of the city um, again that's going well, that way same, back. that same question could be a could be applied over in East Boston, if, if, if all of East Boston, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I do, but I don't think, I think the East Boston program is different. But if I understand your intent, it's really not necessarily to do the Betterment Trust, it's to do whatever the state of the art is that's happening and has met legal muster. And I think that that's a fair request, is to have whatever the state of the art program uh, is come to Dorchester. I would also say that um, I think later this week I'm getting a briefing on the, uh, on what's possible at Dorchester Bay City. And when you think about the things you've mentioned, I mean, every one of them, uh, Mike Christopher uh, and the rest of the team at the Development Review have already briefed me on, like the, the, the things that are happening in Mulkley, the need to, uh, to deal, do something about Kazusko, the fact that that's one of the, the area adjacent to Dorchester Bay City is one of the key places that water could come into the city. And so I think, frankly, there's going to need to be a, a, a public-private partnership over there to get that development to happen and include these key or either down payments or uh, elements entirely of these these key things because the great news is we know what to do it's been identified in concept and to some extent priced and the question is how do we get it into the eventual project that gets developed and i think this is going to be one of those um it takes a village conversations where we say to 
Accordia, um, who I think is the proponent. Yeah. Listen, how, we have these known things that have to happen for this to work. Um, what contribution are you making? And then how do we create an agenda for the state and for other resources of the city to make sure that, as you said, someone with a carriage can get across? Because you're raising the right point. Yeah, yeah, because I'd like to capture some of that, some of that future income, mm -hmm. because there's a lot coming to us. And like I said before, we're, we're we're not used to it. This is just the last couple yep. of years that, it, that it's been happening. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'd just like to say that the Albright Home Ownership Fund is, has limited uh, utility and um, you're still sort of, it's cap helping some people stabilize our, our home ownership, but those, those homes are bought at market rate and they're not inexpensive. So, um, I, I, you know, I think it's, we're looking at any and all, or to look at every tool that we can possibly utilize to yeah. stabilize our community and get, get more home ownership opportunities. Um, I think one issue that might be worth looking into, I think Councillor Baker is, uh, is just even thinking about all the huge development that's happening in, uh, in Alston Brighton is even just looking at the possibility of a district improvement financing model that might be able to invest in public transit or local transit infrastructure, because that's the one thing where we're seeing a huge amount of development, but where our transit infrastructure is not up to the job of, mm -hmm. of delivering and moving large numbers of people around to support the, the level of development that we're going to see and that we are seeing. Um, so the air rights issue um, is, in, you know, due to the land scarcity, we're seeing a lot of increased in interest in developing land rights over 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 a transit infrastructure like in Alston Brighton. Harvard is looking to have air rights over the I-90 project, and certain, you know, to in the area of what the new possibly West Station will be located. Um, I'm just wondering, do we have? Is the research department doing any research in, into how air, rate, air rights relate to local zoning? And it's a complicated. I know nothing about air rights, uh, but it is it is becoming an increasingly topical subject. Yeah, I think. Um, uh, so I, I think we should probably sit down and talk about air rights in detail. My uh, limited understanding of the I ninety project that relates to air rights. It has to do with the financial modeling associated with it, because it is out, outlandishly expensive to do air rights development. And I think we need to make sure that in our conversations with the federal government, the state, and Harvard around what can happen with the Beacon Yards project and the relocation of I-90, that the, the absolute best possible benefits flow to the city of Boston, and that we pay an appropriate share for it, because there's, there's a capital project there that uh, Chief Franklin Hodge's team will be responsible for uh, implementing, but uh, not overpay for that, right, and preserve our dollars for uh, the great programs that we want to run and the other 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 uses in the mayor and city council's purview where our dollars can flow. So I, I would say we're, we are we are supporting the BTD team with the consultants to understand the financial implications of the air rights project um, and the permitting implications are significant as well. Very good. Um, and then Im impact advisory groups, like they, they do yeoman's work. Um, they impact and uh, looking at overseeing all our Article 80 projects. Uh, one concern we have, and right now we've got about 23 projects in the works. And uh, we, we did ask, we did file a um, 17F just to get a better handle on who who's serving on IAGs. And, you know, I think the BPDA has, has, doesn't have a centralized database or a spreadsheet that keeps track of everybody. I know that in our district we have some individuals are serving on about 11 to 19 IAGs uh, as a full-time job. Yes. I also wonder how, uh, with all due respect to the, the, the efforts they're making, how you can possibly review f that number of projects and without having a sort of a, <laughs> it begs a question. Yeah. And the other issue that we're trying to do in our, in our office is trying to diversify the representation on, on IAG so that we have a broader, uh, more representative group of people who 
who represent the neighborhood better. So that's a work in progress. So we're wondering if the BPDA could implement a more centralized record retention policy with IAG appointments so that we can actually track who, who's serving and what their diversity looks like and just to get a better handle of, like we try ourselves to keep track of it, but um, it's difficult. The other issue with regard to IAGs is the oversight role. Um, they, they provide an, a critical oversight role to help guide um, the development process. And I really feel that a robust IAG can improve a project really dramatically um, and make it more, um, more respect, responsive to community concerns. So I was just wondering, um, is it possible for um, you know, the draft cooperation agreements with IAG members? IAG members get them, but our district councillors would also love to see those, uh, the draft community um, benefits agreements, that, that uh, the memorandum of understanding that's written ahead of it getting to the board, because uh, we can give some timely, <laughs> timely feedback. Um, and then it's also our job to sort of oversee the community mitigation and see that it's appropriate and um, and see if if community benefits are are targeted in a way that's that's beneficial to the neighbourhood. Um, the other big concern I don't know if anyone's doing any work on it is the issue about um, you know micro micro particles and and just the air pollution along. I know there's a lot of work being done in the Chinatown, um, and, and, and Councillor Coletta has issues with the East Boston and the, and the, the air, airport especially. Um, we have the, the I-90 I coming through, and we, is, is there someone doing research on the environmental impacts on, on, you know, more, on, diver, on populations outside of Chinatown and East Boston? Like, just thinking along the Southeast Expressway and and the I-90 coming into Boston, there's a huge number, hundreds of thousands of cars that come in every day. Um, is there anyone doing that? And, one, and the reason I'm asking is we're building a lot of housing right there, yeah. right on the pike. Um, and it's, um, it begs the question, are we really paying enough attention to air quality in those, in those homes and those, those, um, those housing units? Uh, to, take, to take the last question first, um, that I don't know off the top of my head, but I believe uh, Rich McGinnis, uh, who's our Deputy Director for uh, Climate and Resilience Planning, would probably speak eloquently to air quality studies and what is and, what is and is not being currently studied and by whom, so that's an answer we can certainly get you. Um, to the point about I IAGs, it sounds like you have some constituents who may want to apply for some of our open jobs. It seems like they're quite, quite engaged and we're happy to pay them for our services. But uh, I do, as we've been hearing from um, uh, constituents and, and even staff members about where are there are opportunities for reforms, uh, the impact advisory group process is something that has come up uh, a, n a numerous times. Just you know, transparency, who's serving on these, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the process by which people get nominated, how are these, uh, how, how is that transparent, how is that inclusive? So these are, you, I think you're asking us the right questions. Uh, we don't have the answers to that yet, but those are important answers for us to develop. Thank you. And uh, let's see, there was one more. Um, climate readiness. Um, I know in East Boston there's rising sea levels, and um, Madam Chair, can I finish? Of course. Um, in Alston Brighton, you know, we have the, the possibility like riverine fr flooding, and along, we're on the Charles, the floodplain of the mm -hmm. Charles, a good chunk of all this land that's going to be developed in North Alston is on the floodplain. So stormwater management and, <coughs> and just f thinking about, I know we, the first place we go with regard to climate impacts is sea level rising. But the other issue is we've, is stormwater, stormwater flooding and then heat, the heat island effect mm -hmm. because we have a lot of, it's basically deforested, Alston Brighton. Alston doesn't have many trees. It's a, it's a persistent heat island problem. So thinking about, um, the impacts, like really insisting and working with developers to, if you're developing as previously industrial space that was sort of asphalt or hardtop, to say you know, creating green space as well as um, to try and mitigate some of these heat island effects going forward. I mean, absolutely, and I know that's an area that numerous of our numer numerous planners and urban designers on our team are passionate about, and we actually have uh, landscape architects on our team to take a look at precisely these issues. So. 
Um, the, the, the answer is overwhelmingly yes, but the, I think the details matter for the specific planning project or the, or the specific development. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Bach, you have floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got a few more. I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna try to do um, project level stuff. I think I have 18 active uh, large project article 80s like right now. Um, and yeah, we just can't do that in our eight minutes. Um, so I guess the zero net carbon building zoning, you guys put in your appendix sort of the timeline on that. I'm slightly antsy because although I think the timeline hasn't technically slipped in that you're still saying that you're gonna have it done by the winter, like the end of this year, I don't feel like I at least have seen a lot of, of like meetings and such happening in the last few months. So, and obviously you've been in a time of transition. So I guess, and you know, for context, Arthur, it's just that I just feel like we've had this hovering at the threshold of zoning for a while now. Um, and it's super important that it actually get across that threshold. So can somebody speak to kind of our confidence about meeting that deadline? Well, I, I guess what I'd say through the chair to um, um, Councilmember Bach, so we've got a lot of things that are hovering near the edge of zoning, and um, we're going to have to honestly make some probably tough decisions about what the priorities are. There's a team working this issue, um, and I expect them to, to make the date that they proposed, but um, I've got zoning in. Charlestown, South Boston, uh, the fan, I've got just the number of places where I've got zoning that is essential to affect and control development uh, is, is a large number of places. Um, so I'm gonna weigh this concern against against those, but I think we're gonna, if we advertise, what would, calendar we made, we're gonna, we may, we're gonna make. And, and I would just say, I would challenge you to challenge us to provide political support. I mean, to some extent, how quickly something can go into zoning is a question of how long is a piece of string, right? It's all about what's the resistance and what's the support and, and can it, and to me, it's like, if we have three major things that need to go into zoning, like, damn it, they can all go in in the same meeting. Like, yeah. I just, I don't think that everything has to be consecutive here. So I just wanted to underscore my view on that matter. Um, Second, what Councillor Coletta said, I'm glad to see you guys are doing the class and comp study. It's tough that it can't come in a year sooner. I think I've been conducting my own informal exit interviews whenever you lose a good staffer who I liked working with. And I really feel like the external perception may be that it's been the uncertainty at the agency. Um, but my exit interview suggests that it's just pay like over and over again. I've had multiple conversations with really good people who were at your agency who have said, I would have loved to stay. It's just like, I couldn't even get a modest raise and these other folks were offering me more and it wasn't like you even needed to match. It was just like, they're not moving close enough. So just really want to underscore that that seems like an issue. Um, you know, like every IMP is up next year. Almost all of them are in my district. Um, I would really like to be deeply involved in how we reimagine that um, institutional master planning process. Um, and in particular, you know, to, to dovetail on Councillor Braden's point, you know, I also think that in addition to questions about enrollment numbers, questions about commitments from institutions on what proportion of their students they're requiring to live on campus, I think are really important. One of the things we've seen is a dynamic where dorms might get built, but then only students with very high incomes are able to, family incomes, not really student incomes, um, are able to access them. And so they're not displacing the demand for our family housing stock in neighborhoods like Fenway and Mission Hill the way that we'd like them to. So I think thinking about like actual programmatic things, like yeah, now not just the freshmen, but also the sophomores have to live on campus or whatever seems like an important piece of that puzzle. And just in general, I think our institutions um, could be asked to do more. And I think we saw what it looks like when they do do more in the COVID um, yes. emergency. That's something that I try to stress is it's not just hypothetical. I think a lot of our institutions did really step up. Um, to Councillor Baker's question, um, I think the legal distinction is that the betterment was kind of just like a gen general fund for the neighborhood. Whereas for I think what's stood up better is things that are tied to specific like mitigation related to the impacts of projects. So my sense is that transportation can absolutely fall into that. An example would be we've got Terra Street transforming on my district, in my district from light industrial to residential. This is in Mission Hill. 
we have a funded study to figure out the future of Terra Street because it needs to be turned into a street for people, which it hasn't been historically. Um, but the study is sort of chasing the tail to your point of what order is development of all these proposals on the street that are getting greenlit. And so as a result, what everyone on the street has been doing is committing a certain amount per square foot of dollars to fund the transportation improvements that we're going to decide on collectively at Terra Street. So we've sort of like agreed to put that money together so that they, we can then execute on a plan. And I think we're looking similarly in Fenway. We just have enormous development. And, and again, we've been getting commitments from folks per square foot to kind of like fund tra a transformative thing. And I continue to need more city help pulling together all of the stakeholders on Fenway transportation, but that's something to follow up on later. Um, I think just on linkage, just a note that it seems to me like we need to be thinking about linkage and, as, and I know we're thinking already about a different rate for labs and we need that because there's a lot more profit under the hood on the labs right now. Um, but I think it's not just about capturing the total profit. I think it's also this tension where the better we make the IDP policy, the more that we may drive people to then just flip from residential to lab or commercial because they're like, well, I don't have to do this IDP thing if I'm over on this side. And so I think part of the goal has to be to have a linkage policy that sort of equalizes for that so that you're not incentivized to flip from residential to lab because it doesn't have IDP because linkage is so much larger that basically like it ends up being a wash, right? So I just would flag that there does seem to me to be a real relationship as we try to drive use decisions. Um, LifeSci, everyone's talked about the workforce development, super important, having a strategy, making everyone pay into the strategy. It's kind of the same thing with transpor transportation. It's like, how does the city, with you as the planning chief, how do we move from, at this snapshot moment in time, the right insightful community member has to be in the room and go, we need a speed bump right there. And then the developer who's trying to get the thing across the line goes, okay, I'll pay for a speed bump right there. And then it's like, voila, you have a speed bump there. And like, sometimes it's nice. You're like, hey, we achieved that, but it's so random. And I think it gives people this feeling of like randomness of like, and it also creates the anxiety Councillor Fernandez Anderson was talking about of like, did I go to the right meeting? Did I say the right thing? And I feel like what we need is more of a thing where all of our developers are sort of paying predictably and substantially into these like public mitigation needs and then we're really quarterbacking what needs to get provided whether it's transportation or this like a serious lab ecosystem for workforce development for our kids especially our black and brown kids folks coming out of BPS like I just feel like that's the that's the quarterbacking role where I feel like the agency has been stuck ushering projects through the development process instead of playing that like quarterbacking role and turning the projects into like handmaidens for like our goals, right? And that is the transformation that I, I fundamentally hope you will be able to achieve. Um, we'll follow up on urban renewal. You know, I have a bunch of specific things about how that data is presented to the council and how we kind of move forward on analyzing that over this year. Um, I said this at the schools hearing this morning, but I really think BPDA and schools need to get more joined up so that again, we can be yep. making those development asks related to key needs for our schools. And then the last thing is just to say that I am gonna follow up on those McLaughlin Park parcels. Devin, you answered my email, so thank you for that. Um, but the, uh, there's a couple of parcels owned by BPDA. They're small, they're actually literally adjacent to an existing urban wild. They're extremely vertical. They're filled with old growth trees on Mission Hill and like they should just get folded into the urban wild um, that they're connected to. But Technically, they're sort of sitting there in the agency's hands and it makes the tenders of the urban wilds anxious and I just think we should like move them formally into parks custody. So just wanted to flag that I'll be following up on that. So, um, and I have a 4.30, so I am headed out. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and I'm sorry to miss the tail end of the hearing. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Uh, Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also, um, this is gonna be a lightning round for me because I have to get going, but um, I'm just so grateful for everybody uplifting all the great work that's happening in East Boston. So thanks, everybody. Um, Neighborhood Housing Trust, happy to answer any questions. Um, we uh, went through that together. Um, there are still some kinks. I would love to hear offline how that's going. Um, not now, don't worry about that. Um, and just grateful for my colleague, Councilor Bach, uh, talking about incentivizing um, builders to stay 
in the housing space rather than lab space because we're already seeing that in Suffolk down. So um, underscoring that and then love the push to, to quarterback um, appropriate mitigation for our neighborhoods. I often feel like our office is pushing one thing when it comes to development, and then the BPD is pushing another thing. You know, if, if, is it traffic calming measures? Oh no, we want more affordable housing. Can we all just get on the same page? So let's make sure that we have um, good lines of communication through project managers, whoever, just put me in, in the right direction on that. Um, I was gonna get into waterfront planning, but Arthur, you've been here for two weeks. I would love to talk to you at some point about waterfront planning. I mean, we need to start planning for the inclusion of everybody. And there's a way to do it where we're um, protecting blue jobs that are dependent on maritime industrial use while also trying to build um, housing that is inclusive of everybody um, while also making sure that we're meeting our climate ready goals, while also making sure that we have inclusive um, business spaces. So just letting that um, you know, be set on record and that mm -hmm. it's, it's a priority for me. So, Understood. did you want to speak on that? I'm eager to, I'm eager to sit down with you and talk about it. I have some experience with the East Boston waterfront as a mass, former Massport person, and um, I'd love to talk to you about, about all the issues you mentioned and getting that Venn diagram, the space that they're shared among all those issues. Thank you. Um, I will leave it at that. And just thank you all. Before working with you. Thanks, Council Flora. If we can get um, Ms. Radwin on uh, Zoom ready, please. And I have a letter from Councilor Mejia. She's absent, and I just uh, would like to read it on record. Um, Dear Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means, I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket 0480 to 0486 FY23 budget. Boston Planning and Development Agency. A representative of my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and following up as need be. I am submitting the following questions to be entered into the record with the hopes of getting a response from administration, the administration either during or after the hearing. And she has some questions. Um, is Ms. Radden available? Okay. Um, Ms. Radwin, I can ask her questions after we listen to, we have only one person on waiting, so. Ms. Radwin, um, I'm gonna give her a title. I'm gonna call her Sister Radwin. She's a fan and she sent a message to my um, office saying that Ways and Means have now become must-see TV. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> that you can interact with. It's Ms. better Radwin than must is a fan. <laughs> so I, look, I always look forward to her testimony. We'll uh, come back to her. Um, Councilor Mejia would like to know, the BPDA requires proponents of large projects in Boston to submit a large access plan. Can you talk through who reviews a language access plan and what is done to ensure that it complies with city, state, and federal guidelines? So I believe the answer, and I can get you a more detailed answer in writing, is that our language access coordinator, that is a role at the BPDA, full-time job, uh, reviews the language access submissions and is responsible for ensuring that we're meeting our language access policy and also coordinating. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty big logistical lift as well to ensure that the appropriate translation and uh, interpretation is available. Thank you. A major complaint we hear in IAG and development meetings across the city is that residents who show up to those meetings only heard about only heard about it from a friend or neighbor. And while developers claim that they handed out flyers in their neighborhood, nobody from the neighborhood can ever back that up. What are we doing to ensure that every abutter is getting information in their hand in a timely manner that reflects the language needs of the neighborhoods? Um, 
I'd say that's a question I'd prefer to answer in follow-up. You know, I'm still coming up to speed on everything that we do in the article process. What do we require of developers? What do staff handle ourselves? And how can we improve that process is something we certainly want to engage with the council on and community members as well. Okay, thank you. Documents sent to the council stated that there is performance-based metrics for promoting certain employees. Can you talk more about what those performance metrics look like 75% of your top earners at the BPDA are white and 71 are male. Mm -hmm. So we do uh, a standard performance assessment across all uh, BPDA employees. There are five, uh, I believe there, oh man, I, I, could, I, could, I think it's five, five or six um, uh, uh, cr uh, performative criteria that everyone is evaluated on a, on a one to five scale. Um, one being needs significant improvement, five being absolutely exceptional, one of the top performers in the agency on that metric there, things like uh, teamwork, um, responsiveness, um, and uh, quality of work, et cetera. And so those are the sort of uh, uh, standard criteria for performance assessments. Uh, in addition, uh, a more qualitative assessment is done on um, uh, based on performance against the goals that the employee and their manager set out for them uh, at the at the at the end of the previous review period, so that's uh, that's an, in a nutshell how that how that system works. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question she has is another comment we hear often from a large number of IAG members and people looking to serve on IAGs is that it is always the same subject and that we are letting people who already have housing decide what housing should look like for people who don't currently have housing in that neighborhood. We held a hearing on this topic last year. I'm curious to learn whether since then any substantive changes have been made to the IAG community review process to make it more accessible to people who have never been a part of the process. That, uh that's a really insightful question from the counselor and, and excited to learn a little bit more about that because I wasn't actually familiar with that hearing, so I'm glad to, excited to go look it up. Um, I don't believe we've made any substantive changes to IAGs over the past year given all the transition work, but we are, like, as already mentioned, looking at doing that in the, in the near future. Okay, thank you. I'll um, reserve my time to Councilor Baker for final round, okay. five minutes. E Thank you. Just a couple questions. Um, I actually had a question for Kenzie. It was was her trust just a sm one street? Does anybody know? Is it is that the trust she was talking about? She we yeah. talked about one street. I thought she was talking about the South Boston Betterment Trust. I, no, well, she mentioned, but when she was citing what she did in her district, it was sounded like one street. So I don't know. I'm Not familiar. I'll have we'll to look into that. Yeah. And the um, so so if I were to do a diff to do a transportation bond. Can you only do a transportation bond? Are there are other bonds you can do, like if I wanted to help finance a field house on Columbia Point, could I do, could I do that? You know, so it would be, I, I think they, uh, is it a social bond now? Could, could, could you do a mix of a transportation, social bond, get the money for the yeah, field house and pay impact. it back in 10 years? I, I think a, um, maybe a broad scale, answer to that question is there there are lots of new creative financing mechanisms that are available in the marketplace social impact investing I think being one of them but um, there's also traditional financing mechanisms for development that we could <coughs> we could look to if it's appropriate um, uh, tax well, increment financing. financing for this field house wouldn't work because they're, they're, they're fundraising for it. it's a 50 55 million gotcha. dollar project right um, that one of the criticisms were the, the, the voice of the youth were not heard, and then yeah. when the youth were involved, the project grew by $30 million. It, it, I guess it would depend on the nature of the project. I'm answering generally in a, in a, 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 right, a, a tax revenue generating of, project. Let me tell you what the nature of the project is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a basically a boys and girls club that's going to encompass indoor fields, outdoor fields, classrooms, um, performance centers, um, spaces where kids in wheelchairs can, yeah. you, you know, like, so we're looking to go at, at the future holistically and deal with, deal with a whole lot of situations that have happened in COVID. So, it's you, an amazing say, project, and I, I think, I, what I, I listen, 
we wanted to communicate is that that sounds like a project that doesn't isn't going to finance itself, right? It's going no. to it, it's not going to have a revenue generating component, or if it is, it's very small. So no. there's a lot of money to borrow against or tax revenues to borrow against. So it needs outside subsidy sources, and it, and it, we'd be happy to work <coughs> with you. And so fundraising, fundraising, and we're going. Uh, I'm going after OPA money also through yeah. here, unable to get any kind of answer. The state has committed. The state has committed. So uh, I'm wondering. Can I take this matter into my own hands and say, okay, I want a bond, I want a, a transportation social bond that will give $30 million I, to this field house? I, I think when it comes to bond financing, we should probably bring in the city's CFO, right? and if it's associated with tax um, revenues, the, the assessor. That's in probably... all due respect, I'm trying to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Fair. Fair. So we could talk first, or, or when, when we do talk about what I should be doing, because the amount of development that's happening, that's, when I talk about capturing future revenue, that's not even getting into Glover's Corner, which is right. about 70 acres mm -hmm. right down around the corner. So for, for my area, you know, I think it's incumbent on myself for the person that comes after me or, or representatives, whoever they are, whoever they be, to try and capture some of, that, some of those dollars to keep some of the money in the neighborhood, but it's also, I'm also not looking to keep all the dollars in the neighborhood because I do believe if there's a housing component, you get mm -hmm. large numbers of dollars in housing, you can, you can build you know, wherever the housing is needed. You know, we can go right outside my district, we can go into Roxbury, we can go into, doesn't matter to me, I'm trying to capture the, right. the future revenue. So, and looking for help. So, so I think through the chair, Senator Member Baker, I think we can get together with <clears throat> the city budget officers, uh, and you know, very very quickly, and, and, and have a huddle about what options exist uh, on this one. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Okay, fair enough. And in in I know this is like an opinion here, Arthur, and I hate to do it to you, but it, would a social bond be a be a, an avenue that I could? Well, that I could go down. I have a little experience with those. You know, you have to be able to demonstrate that there's savings associated with doing the project. Um, and you know, this project, while it's going to have a, a whole series of positive impacts, the actual tracking the money that's the costs that are avoided will be much harder. I think there's between diffs and the budget of the city and a range of other um, mechanisms. I think you know. We can get together with A and F, come see you in a, in a, in a few uh, few days, and actually lay out all the options. Yeah, and and thank <coughs> you, thank you, because I think you talked about savings. Like, mm -hmm. it, we're not going to save anything by building it, but we are going to save. We are going to we are going to improve outcomes for mm -hmm. children's lives. Absolutely, is what we're going to do. So that's going to save. A person's life potentially. I mean, that's hypothetical, but we're going to be saving lives, is what we're going to be doing. Not to get on a soapbox, but um, the memorandum of understanding. That's where that's where we direct the developer money. The MOUs. Now that just directs mitigation because mm -hmm. the IDP money would go to housing trust and job trust. Correct. The linkage money, I think, goes to housing yeah, trust and job trust. The linkage money goes to job trust and housing trust. Right. So memorandum of understanding. What what monies would would be there in the board memorandum? I would. I, I think I turned to Mike Christopher and our legal team to make sure we get the answer right for you. So that seems like something we might want to add to our our sit down discussions. Which which legal documents We're have track to set, which? Set aside a whole day. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be a long conversation, Councilor. I'm excited for it. That's all right. Uh, but yeah. That, yeah, because I, because I do think. There's also the cooperation agreement and other, other documents as well. Yeah, a whole lot of paperwork, and that's what I'm trying to avoid because I think all that paperwork and the more money, the more organizations and the more places that the money passes through, the less actually goes into building units or building real infrastructure that I, I think we need again mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, um, local preference on jobs. Is that 100% based on um, demographics? I would turn to the um, uh, 
Boston Residence Job Policy Office as the experts on that. I'm talking about housing. Who gets in oh, the sorry. units? Who gets sorry. in the units? I thought you said jobs. So for because housing. It, because for me, for me, it's a it's a big problem that you yeah. know neighborhoods go through all this development and and you know years ago when we so we are allowed to, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, so that's we, okay. Um, we we are allowed to have a Boston preference for yeah. housing, but I think you're probably speaking to a more specific sure. neighborhood focus. And we did um, uh, several years ago now, when I was uh, working on Chief Dillon's team, we did um, work on implementing a um, neighbor, neighborhood diversity preservation preference. Um, and that that was uh, a, an attempt to uh, try to, uh, within the guidelines of fair housing law, and not to perpetuate seg segregation, uh, allow for neighborhoods that are already very diverse to have that be uh, the, uh, a, a, a sort of hyper-local pre preference. It is difficult to comply with fair housing law if a neighborhood is not diverse well, because that perpetuates segregation. Well, Dark is supposed to be doing a, uh, a neighborhood preference, yeah. and 0 to 1 to 5 is the most diverse district, the most is diverse zip code in the country. That's mm -hmm. what I've been told. I can't point to any study that, that actually tells me that. So. Are you familiar with the job block? Are you familiar mm -hmm. with the with, with yeah, that, that with that neighborhood preference? And, and and is that going to happen? Is that true? I can't aff affirmatively answer right now, but happy to make sure that, that I would suspect that's, that's part the of case. Our meeting. But yeah, we can. Not going to be part happy of our to, happy to follow up with the answer. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing, so I I believe that to be the case, but I would want to follow up and confirm. Okay, can I ask one more question, at Trent? Trin, the other day you had spoken about a, um, a Fed grant that was $29 million for job. Can, can you dig into that a little bit? What is it for? Is it like $29 million? Are you familiar with it or we could, if, you, if you don't remember? Yeah, I mean, I can talk to you offline with it as well and send you materials if, if I may. Um, it's, you know, we've been working on it for quite some time since last year. It's from the Economic Development Agency called the EDA Good Jobs Grant. It is a competitive grant that any city, municipality, nonprofits can go after. Um, and in the state of Massachusetts, 11 applications. And I think we were uh, one of three applicants uh, from the Boston area. Ours is a regional plan just because it makes it more competitive. It's 29.5 million focusing on um, delivering uh, 4,519 jobs over three years for um, residents in Boston, but also um, regionally as well in three major industries, uh, clean energy, obviously healthcare, and the last one is childcare. Um, and all employers had to sign on to, gear, to do a bit best faith effort and or guaranteed placements after the graduation. So it was a huge endeavor. For 4,000 jobs? For 4,519. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty competitive. If you look at uh, an average cost of 9,000 per training slot for, indus for industry okay. licensure, oh, so that's, that's based on the, the training, state. That's for yes. the training, yes. uh, the, the green jobs. And, and, okay. That's an average cost. Every, every track is very different. That is not an unusual number. It's based from the, the state's Massachusetts training per cost unit. So they run the numbers. We can't use that for all people that we serve, different ages, different economic barriers, but that is a standard that we use. Okay. We, we match it with some and, kind of standard. And I'm just gonna say the same thing I've been saying to you for a while, you don't need to answer it. We need brick and mortar. We need places where we can direct people that are ours. You know, we, we need to start building infrastructures, not platforms, not websites. We need to start building brick and mortar and bringing people in. You don't need to even respond. No, I but I, I do, I do want to say that I, I do want to echo that value statement as the chief and the leadership team has stated that development has to happen with people. And people means jobs and housing and quality of life. And that, you know, I have been been invited and have been active members of, you know, this conversation on quality of life as the city develops. And that includes job training, career pathways, and other indicators that promotes 
inclusivity and also quality of life for residents of, in and around Boston. We still need brick and mortar to, to We to, sure to, do, to, but that, that ain't in my shop that. right now, Counselor. No, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank Welcome. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Yeah. Good to meet you. Do we have uh, Ms. Radwin back? Is she available? Oh, she's available. Ms. Radwin? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm pretty good. How about yourself? Good. Thank you. Nice to have you back. Um, I'll give oh, you, thank you three minutes to testify. Oh, three. Yo. Okay. So the transportation unit in the BPDA is promoting parking ratios for new developments that are far less than the zoning code provides. So we've got developers and neighborhoods caught between two standards, either doing as advised by the BPDA or following the zoning code. Insufficient parking ratios are being specified by the BPDA transportation group in developments near small business districts. As a result, small business owners, which each of these projects have to take time to build strength in numbers, gather together, and provide testimony at the zoning board about insufficient parking ratios. In my community, the parking department, I'm sorry, the Boston uh, Transportation Department itself acknowledges that customers need parking in our spar small business areas. Not only are zoning code violations being built in, the transportation group is seemingly not following its old standards. His, their standards uh, on the website specify that there's supposed to be one to 1.5 spaces per living unit in Roslindale, Hyde Park, and West Roxbury new developments. In essence, they are promoting large Article 80 guidelines in small projects near residential areas. And we've talked about predictability, we've talked about consistency. There's no predictability and consistency when this happens. And just to note that affordable units are far fewer than the 60% in these buildings. So community members have questions. One, are the BPDA and the BTD developing new or modified parking standards for all new large and small development projects? Two, if so, what is the public process for developing these standards? And three, will these standards be voted into the regulations as amendments to the zoning code before they are implemented? Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you so much, Ms. Radwin. Um, would you guys care to answer, please? <clears throat> Through the chair to the uh, to the, the person asking the question, nice to meet you. Um, so I guess I'd like to try to answer the questions in reverse order um, to the best of my knowledge. So um, we're planning to uh, <clears throat> advance a number of our neighborhood plans uh, into zoning. And so what will go into the zoning would be um, what comes out of those neighborhood plans or what has come out of those neighborhood plans um, already. And then there'll be a process um, involving community outreach that also involves presentations to uh, boards and commissions about the adoption of those uh, parking standards. So there's a, a process attached to approving those plans where that will, discussion will happen. Um, we are, B, this BTD and BPDA, I mean, uh, I'm only a couple weeks in here, but we've already had pretty robust discussion about the need to align our two departments' uh, views on uh, parking ratios. Um, so your concern uh, about us being in alignment and on the same page is one that we share, and we'd like to, uh, we're, we're planning to come into, um, we're planning to come into a consensus about that. Um, it's probably not for this particular occasion, but um, the discussion about the need for um, for lower parking ratios is one that I, it sounds like you're very familiar with, and the arguments um, for and against are probably ones you know well. Um, I think that there's going to be a, a, a robust public discussion about them in the context of the plans and the zoning associated with the plans, and, I, and I'm confident you'll be a part of it. Uh, not just as it affects your neighborhood, but, but more broadly. Thank you. I do have um, some questions, and in the interest of time, 
Um, I, I'll just read them into record, and if you can submit them, the answers in, by email, so I can sure. send them to uh, the constituents who sent them. And then just clarify if some of the questions I've noticed that um, it just may be lack of information. Sure. Um, why did you, first question, why did you decide to propose a hearing to focus on distressed properties in Roxbury? What did you hope to, the hearing will accomplish? Has a date been scheduled for the hearing? In the hearing you mentioned an area called D7. Can you tell me where this is, why it's seeing the highest number of decrepit privately owned lots in Roxbury? Why do you think Roxbury has one of the highest rates of distressed residential buildings and vacant developable land in the city of Boston? Who are the owners of these buildings? Are there examples of blighted buildings that are sold to developers? Do, what do they look like? Uh, what do they look like now? I know that you are requesting um, I guess, um, I don't know if it's a community process, but um, a hearing to begin talking about how to determine which properties are being willingly neglected and which are being neglected due to lack of funds. Are there any characteristics that stand out as ways to differentiate between the two types of properties? I think the remaining of these questions are actually directed for, to me <laughs> uh, because I, I filed something um, to explore what to do about decrepit properties in D7. Yep. Um, so I, and, and as I read, they're all related to that, blighted buildings. Um, so I appreciate it if you guys, if there is, if there is a thing, if you can, if you can answer that um, by email, I appreciate it. If you um, have any comments, oh, shout out to Mike Christopher, I just saw you. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your help and your, you're so, um, efficient, always so responsible. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any closing comments or statements, okay. Um, through the chair, I would just say to yourself, all the council members and the audience, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. A lot of great questions. Um, we're gonna try to answer the ones that were just asked in, in I, I think, in the appropriate form, whether that's in writing or another medium. Uh, but but appreciate the uh, time in the audience with you today and look forward to uh, meeting with you uh, in particular among all the others uh, in person and following up. Okay, thank you so much. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.